All right. I do believe we are live. Welcome, everybody, to yet another Break the Rules stream. I am your humble host, Lev Polyakov, joined today by the great and powerful traveler of the world. I consider you to be an artist. I consider you to also be an MI6 agent because you've embraced it with pride. And I think more people should do that to all the criticisms that they get. Lord Miles, it is a great pleasure to have you back on Break the Rules. We are also going to have Masked Bastard coming in at 4.30 p.m. And then we are going to have the lovely Stardust coming in at 5 p.m. And that should be a very interesting combination. Like I mentioned before, Stardust, she is atheist. She comes from an Islamic family. And uh, you have been in circumstances that I think would be very interesting for her to uh, pick your brain on. But uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, what you were doing in Afghanistan, again, I first want to ask you about North Central Island. This is your latest endeavor what exactly is going on there? Why do you want this to be the end of Lord Miles? I think it'll be fun. I mean, imagine having a Wikipedia page that ends with killed by indigenous tribe on an isolated island. I, I think that'll be just a really good end to things. And if I get out, that's a story of a lifetime. That's a best-selling book right there. And I think there's an opportunity as well to go there and teach her about Christianity. Um, it wouldn't be hard to get there. Um, I've seen YouTubers speak saying, oh, it's so dangerous, but there have been people who have got there in the 1990s uh, without issue and just basically did a, did a comical dance and gave them coconuts and was able to shake their hand. So I honestly think there's a possibility of going there without some issue. And I think I can kind of defend myself against, you know, medieval bows um, with basic body armor and stuff like that. I feel like every complaint I've got about it Having worked around, and the only thing holding me back is money. I've got a whole plan, a team in place. It's really retarded, but I think that's what you guys like to see, right? Well, the question about the team is, should you be the one in charge of picking your team now that you've seen what happened with the latest thing in uh, Afghanistan? Just to bounce into that one right now, what was the original intention of you going in there the second time, and why did you get screwed over? How exactly did all that happen? Yeah, so I put together a plan since August time. So when I first became well known online, it was called Operation Return of Tintin. And I had a team of about six people who were US Army veterans. And we would go into Afghanistan um, pseudo illegally and then get out a uh, family and also my tour guide's family and also another group of people. And we would give them to Pakistan or either Iran or Tajikistan. It was going to be on foot, it was going to be very dangerous, and it was going to be great. I had I had deals with some news companies. I was going to make bank off it, and it was going to be a very good thing to do. I invested pretty much most of my life savings, and of course, most of the donations I got. I got right up to the border in, let's see, I've got the name of the place now. Let's see, uh, Bashar. I got into Bashar, which is 20 miles from the Afghan border. So that's in Pakistan. And my tour guy was in on it. Um, he was totally happy with this. We planned it all together. I had a list um, of things we go do. He was talking about sending me a car. He was sending me a picture of a car that's going to pick me up and so on. The day before he just backed out, he just called me, had a major breakdown, just refused to accept any help. I basically was like, bro, we could get you uh, to you know, a nicer country. We've been planning this for seven months. I've basically invested this much. I've sent you this much. Come on, you know, um, I understand you're scared, but otherwise you're screwed because he's wanted by the Taliban. He'll get executed. Otherwise, they're found or he'll have major issues, but um, just refused to. So I was distraught because I invested everything emotionally, financially. I was just, you know, I was feeling like crap, to be honest. I felt like I let everyone down. And technically, I did because it just didn't work out. And at that point, I thought, screw it, I've already got the visa, I'm really on the board, I'm just going to go to Afghanistan and buy and sell some things to make up for my loss. Screw it. And uh, then you were in Afghanistan, you ended up getting food poisoning. What was it that got you the food poisoning, do you know? Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was a fish. Um, <laughs> it was, it was uh, worth it in the end. But it was this battered fish where I had at this high-end restaurant. Um, I met up with this guy from... Afghanistan and he was very westernized he's actually a Christian too um, and he wanted to show me the nice place um, he had and everything around him 
Uh, so we went to this nice restaurant with a group of people. I ate the food, then three of us out of five started throwing up the night afterwards. Uh, and that lasted about two and a half days. But it was kind of worth it because I got free stuff from the hotel and the weight loss transformation was amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't really regret it. Um, I might go back to the same place and then try everything but the fish. It's possible. But when you were in Afghanistan uh, speaking to all the people there, a lot of times on Twitter you say how safe this is in comparison to England. Uh, but when we're talking about the safety, you're talking about the safety of people who, let's say, uh, fall in line. As far as those who don't fall in line, what are the kind of punishments that await you? Well, it depends what you mean by not falling in line. I mean, if you say openly, say something very bad about the government, um, very, if you say something extremely bad, if you call uh, the leader a pedophile and just draw pictures of him doing dodgy stuff, I guess, you'll get thrown in prison. But I feel like if you do something very dodgy in the West, you basically get um, um, the Medal of Journalism, which is a sniper shot to the back of the head by the CIA. So I think really uh, it's all about perspective. I feel like the West, obviously there's some bad stuff stuff goes on in Afghanistan if you step out of line too much. But I think for a new nation, that's kind of expected um, because you want a nation to be very strict at the beginning and then you allow civil liberties when everything's peaceful. If you allow a little bit too much freedom, as bad as it sounds, things will just fall into chaos very, very quickly. Um, and I feel like the West has kind of demonized Afghanistan quite a bit because when I was there, they didn't, when they saw me, they didn't know I was a, a foreigner. They basically thought I was someone from a northern province. I looked like I was from Tajikistan with my skin color. They tried to speak to me in the local language. They didn't understand I was British. It, it kind of blew their minds. And they were very kind to me and everyone was very good in the end. Um, I didn't see too many issues. The West basically makes it seem like, oh, bro, if you step over this line, bro, if you step in the border, you just instantly blow up and they, they take your body and then ISIS just dances around with you, bro. It's just, it's just messed up. It's just how it happens. <laughs> I want to get into this part of the conversation a little bit later when Stardust comes in, because this is something where I feel conflicted. Because on one hand, I understand the idea of, hey, let this culture do whatever it's going to do. But on the other hand, there are certain things that uh, you may not see and other people, you know, like the reporters may not see that's going on behind the scenes. And it's all kind of like a moral question, like the people you mentioned right now that are in there and can't get out and they're under threat. There is like a part of you that was willing to risk your entire life to help these people escape. So the question is, that, oh, yeah. like, how many how many people in general are going to be in that kind of situation where I don't know. It's almost like it's like that, you know, uh, Rudyard Kipling. He had that whole idea, of white man's burden, so on and so forth. The idea being, like, if you are, you know, forget white, if you are just a high level civilization, you know, if you're like a Western civilization, and you see a lot of problems that go on in all these different parts of the world, do you step in? Do you start building? You know, kind of like the whole British Empire idea do you start yeah. building the trains do you start yes. civilized yes yeah, so okay so then there's a, there's a conflict here though this is what i this is the contradiction of lord miles for me because on one hand you respect and enjoy these uh, different uh, cultures but on the other hand you also respect the british empire for going into these various cultures and changing a lot of things there so i'm trying to solve this contradiction and uh, please help me out Oh, yeah, of course. Well, I think the British Empire can kind of keep its territory and the local people can keep a little bit of their culture, of course. Um, I'm very much up for the British Empire, but the American Empire is not exactly my thing. You know, I love America. I love the people. The people are great. Most of them are based. But the government's not my thing. It's like the UK government. When I say I like the, you know, the British Empire, I'm talking about the old British, you know, the good ones, the ones that were you know, strong and had very good morals and a very good attitude to things. But nowadays, you know, I don't think it's too good. I really think India will be better under British rule. And if you speak to a lot of Indians, which do have an inferiority complex for British, um, you see it in their culture and everything, they would almost certainly agree with me. Or if they didn't, it would be a repressed thing. Hmm. Where do you think that comes from? 
Well, <laughs> the British basically took over India with almost no resistance. And then they never did an uprising that was significant. They were subservient to the British constantly. And they've kind of fetishized them as, you know, someone who's higher up in the hierarchy. That's why Indians always try and wear Western clothes. British clothes are very popular in India. And they brought, the business owners buy British companies and they always go after British and try and create relations with the British. And of course, they learn English. And of course, that's a continuation of sometimes, um, it's a continuation of basically colonization. But at the same time, they're carrying on the culture because they realise, well, you know, we're romanticising England and England's pretty great compared to our country because we've got these holy rivers and we poo in them. So, you know, I think England's not too bad. But you were saying that as far as England today goes, you are not a big fan. Where do you think it went wrong? The only thing that I could say is uh, Break the Rules have had a uh, historian who uh, talked about where, where he sees England uh, going the wrong direction. And he had a term that he used, which I haven't really heard that much, called uh, our betters. That's how he described this idea in England that people did realize that there are some people who were considered to be your betters, not even because of some kind of a social rank, because their parents happened to come from British royalty, but just the idea of people being more refined, acting more refined. There was something about that that uh, was said by this historian to not exist anymore. Is he right? Oh, absolutely, yes. If I go to central London and speak to um, some friends of mine who I've you know, met recently, they will act very refined, very posh, very good. And there's an aura around that where you respect them immensely. But if I go to Birmingham and listen to the conversations of five minutes, I kind of want to grab their head and smash them into a rock several times. And I can imagine if you send uh, one of those Birmingham people uh, to India, I think the Indians would <laughs> very much stop liking England um, very quickly. So I think it's about having this you know, mutual respect um, for your fellow English person by acting very posh, very refined, having strong morals, acting together, and not having this liberal nonsense as running the country nowadays. All right, so you uh, said the trigger word right now, liberal, because I would argue that a lot of these betters that I was speaking about and that you were speaking about, they would consider themselves to be liberal. As in, like, if we just uh, Google liberalism right now, what do we get? Because I don't think it will match up with uh, what people consider it to be. So, okay, here we go. Liberalism, uh, a political and social philosophy that promotes individual rights, civil liberties, democracy, and free enterprise. A lot of these things, I think, were absolutely necessary for there to even be a British Empire in the first place. You know, like, uh, the British Empire was not a matter of just having these bunch of serfs that were just following whatever it is that the king or queen said, right? Like, there is something to the idea that these you civil... Think... Yeah? yeah? Go on. Well, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think the queen, king or queen who is in charge of the entire country is exactly democratic. And I don't exactly believe in democracy. It's very um, retarded. I mean, what, would you let the average person you've met in real life vote? I wouldn't let half the people vote in, in my experiences. I mean, if you walk into a university, I really wouldn't let these people have any influence over anything um, <laughs> at the end of the day. So I feel like the British Empire also did have a system where certain people weren't allowed to vote because you know they didn't ac actually influence England. I mean, India was part of the British Empire, but I don't think India was allowed to vote in British Parliament most of the time, anyway. Um, so I think you know it was not talking about in absolutes like liberalism, saying. And the definitions change dramatically. Most people that were liberal back in the day were speaking about the idea of bringing over British excellence to other countries to civilize them because you know, they, they basically had very backwards lives. Um, and I think nowadays liberalism is very different. So I think we have to account for that as well. I don't think there's much disagreement as far as democracy goes between the two of us. I agree about democracy being tyranny of the majority for the most part when you get a bunch of people yeah. who 
don't really know uh, one thing from another as far as uh, civics go to now be able to decide the fate of a nation, that's very troublesome. And that's not something that the British system ever had, nor does the American system. Oh, the American system, it has maybe to more of an extent, but still, it's not full-on democracy. There's still a represent representative democracy going on here, with the idea being that we have these elites, and the elites are supposed to be responsible, so whatever it is they decide on would be in the best case for the uh, nation. But I think we'll both agree that's not yeah, really I mean what's been going on right now. It never happens. I think there was a study done where it said 98% of popular opinions that are put towards, I think, a government in the West are never actually voted. The opposite outcome um, happens. So if 98% of people are in favour of a new law, it won't become a thing in the US or UK or wherever. Um, democracy has no real correlation or um, no real connection to actually the general people's opinion. So, and I don't really believe democracy is alive nowadays anyway. I mean, I think there's a lot of corruption. It's called lobbying um, and so on. So I don't even think you know, democracy is even real. I think it's just a facade to give people uh, you know, a happy, good feeling that they did something for their country when exactly they didn't. Um, and no one cares about their opinion because have you heard of them? Like, you know, they're terrible. Well, what is uh, what is your opinion then of something like populism? Because at least in the United States right now, with uh, Donald Trump jumpstarting uh, this uh, thing that I think hasn't really been that much active in the let's say uh, 80s, 90s. It was much more active in the early 20th century. A lot of populist movements. But uh, now it seems like we do have a bunch of uh, people in the United States who say that we are not being represented and we need somebody to go out there and represent us. And I'm of two sides here, where on one hand, I like that they're against a lot of stupid policies that a lot of people in the elite in the United States are, uh, are having, you know, as far as critical race theory, as far as the gender studies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, as well as a lot of people who are quite uh, openly uh, socialist in what they want to do in the United States. But on the other hand, there is also this idea of a dictator stepping in and saying, I am for the people, the people are on my side. And like you just said right now, democracy is fraught with these people who come in and they uh, change things for the worse. So where do you stand on the whole populist angle? Well, I think I like it to some degree, but at the same time, this idea of, oh, this group of people aren't being represented and so on is a little bit, you know, it's it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when it comes to populism, because that's why people call for it, because there's so many different groups. I think go to the root cause and just make uh, the U.S. a homogeneous society and basically repeal the Immigration Act. Um, that would create a lot more happiness. It would improve civil society massively. Um I think it'll be good at the end of the day. I mean, you know, maybe the GDP might fall just a little bit, but uh, you know, it's a happy exchange. I think most people will be in for. I don't know. My personal take, I'm curious what you think, is I would just want people to be judged according to merit, which is not really something that I think has been successfully tried. Where, for example, like in uh, Britain, you would have people, if I'm not mistaken, who come from India who are, you know, very well educated, want to be the best, and I'm not saying everybody, but for those who do, want to be the best Englishman or Englishwoman they could possibly be. And then you have other people who, let's say, come from, you know, there are some stories about the Pakistan immigrants who come into Britain, they live in these poor neighborhoods, and they end up uh, having a lot of these, you know, horrible situations with uh, the uh, British working class uh, girls there who uh, are roped into these, uh, these uh, rape gangs. So I see a very big, di big difference between one and the other, and I think it is very easy to discriminate based on, you know, do you come from a good family? You know, do you have the same values? Like, that, I think, could be a much better metric in terms of how, who do you let in or not. Well, I think of a lot, a lot of the times while they don't have the same values because they don't come from the same religion, same background, same upbringing, same culture. If they're really so clever and want to come to one of these countries, why don't they make their own country excellent? And then, you know, they'll give us a run for our money. But they really don't because they want to basically brain drain their own country, jumping from another country like an opportunity, it's like a coward almost, abandoning their own people to try and go to another place 
to get more money and then kind of, I, I, I would say, put more pressure on the system, send money back home. Uh, so, you know, they even abandon their country, which is bad, or they send money back home, which is less money going into our country, which you know doesn't help. And then people suffer because there's not enough jobs going around. And then ever since, you know, women started working, the workforce has doubled and suppliers not really doubled. It's near, but it's not the same. So it's a little bit harder to find employment nowadays. And, uh, you know, according to modern liberals, um, the supply and demand doesn't apply to wages uh, when it comes to workforce too. And that's why, you know, people in the 70s had a lot more money than us, a lot more purchasing power. And now pretty much people in the richest country of the world, which is also very diverse, the US, now struggle to put food on the table. Um, and now they let in more and more people. And I, I, I can understand if someone maybe had a PhD and they were very influential or they had a new technology. You know, maybe, you know, I, I can see that. You can make a case of that. But when it's just random people coming over the border, um, being let in and then given citizenship and welfare, I'm not exactly up for that. I don't want my hard-earned tax money which I don't pay anyway, but you know, if I did pay taxes, I don't want my hard-earned money going to some random person who's not working or you know, got in this country in very dodgy ways. Well, this is very uh, interesting. I want to break this down a little bit, but first off, there was a question earlier on here uh, from R1234233, who was the historian? And that was Sean Lang, Senior Lecturer of History at Anglia Rush Ruskin University. I don't know if you're close to there. I don't know where exactly. I think that that is in London. I'm not sure how close you are to where that is. But uh, to break down what you said right now, I want to make sure that we understand each other. When I'm talking about the immigration, I'm not talking, number one, I'm not talking random. I'm not talking random assortment of people. I'm also not talking going through the back yeah. door, as in getting here illegally. So to me, those two things are off the table. So as far as defining who exactly gets to participate in the Western culture, society, if we're talking about people with PhDs who you would make room for, that's like the far end of your gradient. Then you're going to have people who, you know, can do something that millions of people in the United States can already do. And we could say, okay, like there's already all these people here in the U.S. or in Britain who need these jobs, who don't have these jobs. So I can understand uh, that part of the argument. But then if you are talking about people who really strive as much as they can to, you know, be somebody who kind of like I think with the point system they have in Australia, where there is a certain demand that maybe is not met right now as much by the people who are currently here. And maybe there is a way to show that this person is absolutely patriotic. And there are people who have, I think, been exposed to the United States or to the Western culture in different parts of the world. To give you one example, I brought on uh, during a previous BTR stream, there's a gentleman I know who's in computer science who's from Iran. Iran, as you know, is a uh, dictatorship right now. The people who end up fleeing from there don't really want to live in that kind of place. And you could say, well, he's a coward. He should have stayed behind in Iran and overthrown the government. But at a certain point, like, you need a certain amount of people to be able to do that. And that's where I'm conflicted with you here, where... I don't think he would have been able to achieve the success and the uh, various things that I don't think he's taking for granted any day that he was able to achieve in the U.S. over there, so, which is why I'm conflicted about this oh, idea. Of, oh, just let him go on. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, not a bad attitude, though. But yeah, um, you know, the people that were trying to, um, you know, run away from British in America, they should have just all ran to Mexico, you know, they shouldn't have put up a fight for a better life and improve themselves. They just, just surrendered or just ran away to a different richer country. It's so true because that's how greatness is made. You just run away and then look after yourself. <laughs> Sometimes you leave away your extended family and all your friends because you know you want uh, you want a certain amount of money or so on because that's, you know, that's all good. Honestly, I've I've looked into Iran. It's a very safe country most of the time, a lot, as long as you don't do anything very dodgy. And I, I see no issues with the nation most of the time. Um, but, you, but you could imagine that there are people who don't vibe with that particular culture in Iran, right? Like, you could imagine that there are people there who, you know, grew up, you know what, they're not big fans of the mullah, they're not big fans of the clerics, 
they're big fans of, I don't know, Levi's blue jeans or whatever. You know, they're big fans of American culture and they would want to contribute to the United States, not only working hard, but being really good at what it is they do. And for those people, the difference I'd say between the people in Iran versus the uh, revolution, pre-revolutionary war United States is that at that point, the United States already had a lot of people within the leadership there, you know, local leadership, militias, who were already on board with the idea of separating. It wasn't just a couple of people that were being persecuted. From what I understand, it was a sizable amount of people, including people who were in leadership there, who took this thing on. So I guess it is a matter of gradient, right? Like on one hand, you have a handful of people, relatively speaking, in Iran who wouldn't really be able to make some change, so they're going to go to the U.S., and on the other hand, you have pre-revolutionary war United States. So at least I see one side being too small to accomplish what you're talking about and the other side being just big enough and just influential enough to do so, but I guess that is where we differ. You would want well, it's like, both to do yes. so. It's a, it's a gradient to some degree, but at the same time as well, if they're, if they're running from persecution, you, know, you should just go to the next country over maybe. A lot of the people who run from Afghanistan and go all the way through you know, Central Asia, Middle East, then to Europe and so on, they don't stop at France or Germany or um, Italy a lot of the time. They always try and go to England because we've got the best welfare system. Mm. Um, they can easily start a happy life in France. France is a lovely country. Uh Actually, not so much now to my immigrants, but you know what I mean. It could be a lovely country um, for no, another person to go to and live in. But no, they just want a better life. I mean, if you're running from safety, you would go from, I don't know, Iran to maybe Turkey or even Iraq, maybe. Because Iraq's pretty safe for right now if you live near the capital or on the outskirts. But no, they're going there for economic reasons because they want a little bit more money in their pockets to basically supply their little lifestyle and so on. Of course, it's a gradient, but I've seen at the same time, it's not exactly... Wait, know, wait, so supply what, what lifestyle? Well, they want a very, I think, materialistic lifestyle. I think they want to be a little bit selfish, where they just want to have the best of the best. It's like this huge culture. Even I came across in Afghanistan, they're, they're meshing me. I had the Taliban meshing me, going, bro, how much are iPhones in America and England? Get me an iPhone 13, bro. You know, they're not exactly going... Oh, you know, I'm being persecuted really badly right now. Help me get to another country nearby and not, you know, get me to England because I want X, Y, Z. It's like, that's why I was trying to help my tour guide. He didn't want to come to England or Germany or anything like that. He's wanted to go to the neighboring country for safety. But then I had about 50 other people message me going, help me get to America, bro. I really want to go to uh, California. Um, I heard there's money there. I want loads of money, bro. And so on. And I was mm. thinking, wait, wait, so you're in danger. Why not go to Pakistan? And they go, oh, oh, it's better in America. And I go, yeah, but Pakistan's quite good. You know, it's it's similar in culture to some degree and it's still jobs in Pakistan. You go, yeah, bro, but you get paid like 500,000 a month in like pay, bro, if you work at a corner shop. That's one. That's actually a quote I came across, by the way. 500,000 at a corner shop. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you have well, this I... idea, mate. Well, yeah. then I want to make Sorry, sure, like when, well, when you're saying this, I want to make sure again that you're not speaking to who you may have been speaking to on Twitter as far as a straw man of these people who say, oh, all immigrants welcome, you know, refugees welcome, everybody should come in. I think you realize by now that this is not what I'm saying, right? Yeah, That's, of course. You're yes. kind of a case by case basis, depending on education, some sort of algorithm that will add up all the points and go yes or no and so on. But then there's going to be ways around it. Also, I think we should send economic aid to other countries, reduce immigration, and then insert some of our policies into their country where it helps our interests, say, I know, a trade deal where there's no import taxes and so on, or something like that, you know, you get the gist. And then from there, they build up their country, their country's safe, it's it's um, more prosperous, they've got what they want, and then we get a ton of more money coming to our country, mutually benefited, and then we can project our power through those countries, to neighboring countries, which are, are our enemy. 
instead of just bringing loads yeah. of people, destabilizing our own nations, and then watching those other nations that are losing the best of the best that are trying to leave become really tragic. And then the country falls into more disarray, where more immigrants come out, come to our country, destabilize our country, and so on. But then we get into this uh, situation where if you want there to be investment into other countries, again, kind of like what the British Empire was doing, the British Empire, from what I read, it wasn't even making a lot of money from those countries. It was uh, making money from, I believe, places like Brazil. I don't remember places that weren't even under their banner, but just in terms of material wealth, they were not doing as well with India, with a lot of these other uh, satellite uh, colonies. So from what I understand, I think the reason why the British Empire invested was in this idea of we can make these places better, we can make the people thrive there. But again, it just the conflict here is, if I'm not mistaken, because you like the kind of government that they have in uh, Afghanistan right now and uh, Iran, if we're talking about investing in these countries... Do you then want, as far as investing in education goes, do you still want there to be like this very harsh, uh, incompatible with the West Sharia law within these countries, yet they're going to be taking a lot of money from the West in terms of uh, upkeep and aid? That's that's something that I have kind of a problem with, but I'm curious, like, where, where do you see that going? Well, like I was saying, I wasn't speaking about Muslim-majority countries because they were never aligned with our interests. I was speaking about you know, India, maybe some other countries that are similar. Like um, Poland would be an excellent investment nowadays anyway. Stuff like that. I wouldn't say... You know, well, we India, invest India's in, pretty uh, Muslim too. Like India, India's got a lot of Muslims in there. I think it's... Uh, I think there are... I don't know how many Muslims there are exactly, but I think there are more Muslims in India than there are in uh, Pakistan. I may be wrong about oh, that. Oh, but not by percentage, make it not by percentage. Um seventy nine point eight percent are Hindu, twelve percent so fourteen percent are Islam and two point three percent are Christians. I think we really, you know, as a British Empire, we failed in establishing a Christian mission in India and that could have easily grown. Um, you know, if the Pakistanis there are obviously a huge minority and most of them are probably just from uh, Pakistan or other areas of there, uh, or just left over from division that the British brought about. But I really think you could change the demographics of a country for the better. And you know, I feel like the countries that are doing the best of the world can decide that, especially Western countries, because that's what all expansion is all about. Um, imperialism, the stuff we were doing against the British Empire. And that's why we, we basically civilized half the, half the globe. And with that, I want to bring in Mass Bastard for his take on what is going on here. All right, I'll tell you right now. The yeah. best expansion ever released was Brood War for StarCraft. <laughs> Nothing has added as many features, so new units, the whole campaign. Oh, man, what an expansion. Lord Miles, where do you stand on Brood War? <laughs> I haven't, I haven't played much of it to be honest. Um, Oof, I'm, I'm guessing brother, we're trying to get sponsored on. by Raid Metal Legends or something. No, no. Okay, why is this Brood War? Yeah, Starcraft, Starcraft Brood War. Brood War, the best expansion ever. Wait, who did you play okay, as, Mass can... Bastard? Did you play as Tehran, Proto, Zerg? Oh, I was a Protoss player. Let me tell you, mm. I, I, I like to do this cannon strategy where you rush to the other guy's base and start building cannons to box them in. That was, I, I was that <laughs> bastard. What about that creating the uh, what about creating the dark archons? Were you a fan of those? Oh yeah, that was that was the brood war, wasn't it? I believe they so. They were the invisible guys that had uh, like big swords or something, or like mm. knife arms. So that's Star right. And I think StarCraft was created from the idea of Warhammer 40k. Like they oh, stole the idea. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind that was yeah. Warhammer. Because if Warcraft was Warhammer, then StarCraft had to have been from Warhammer 40k. Mm. This makes perfect sense. Now, in all seriousness, no, going back, because I want to finish this particular subject here as far as what exactly is going to happen with the uh, immigration. Uh, Mass Bastard, you already know my position. If people can be at a certain civilization level, then I'm cool with that. And I'm just, I just want to tell you, Miles, like, 
I don't think my position has been tried that much in the last uh, century at all, where what you're saying goes like way, way, way further down as far as I think, uh, well, number one, certain repercussions that would happen, you know, this feeling that people get where like, fuck, it's not fair, you know, and sure, you could say, well, life isn't fair. There's nothing you could say about that. But I still think having this... (laughs) I still think that having this idea of if we can show that you are at a certain level as far as how you raise your kids, what you bring to the table, then people, I mean, sure, you could have people who would say, well, it's still not fair. But still, I think objectively, you could say you can make the case that now at least we have a system that judges on merit, not a system that just lets anybody in who wants to get fancy shoes and just wants to use all the money that could have otherwise gone to the people who live, uh, you know, in the United States and England, uh, you know, just spend on material wealth without having any sense of loyalty, any sense of patriotism towards the country that they're in. So that is my yeah. position at least. But uh, I, I understand your position too. I just think that there's a lot of loophole, that there's a lot of uh, problems potentially down the line when you do something like that. Again, just saying like, oh, because you came from here, you're never allowed to be in this country unless you are like yeah. some Albert. Yes, okay. I don't know what to tell you. I just think that there's a lot of there's a lot of problems there. But I don't know, mass bastard. Is there any opinion? Oh, I don't want to drag you into this if you don't want to. But if there is anything you want to say about it. Uh, now is the time. If not, I will move on. So you, you're talking about immigration into the country flat out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, some people, uh, there, there's many good immigrants into the country that, uh, you know, come through legally and want to want to come here and work and do something. And there's people that just want to sneak in and try to cause trouble. Oh, no, we are way past that. We're not even talking about that part of it. We're talking more about whether we stop immigration at people who can be proven to, let's say, raise their kids in the same way, be, you know, as close as possible to, you know, what is traditionally thought of as having, you know, American values or having English values in the case of Lord Miles. Mm. So that would be well, that's interesting. How do you even prove that? How do you like most cultures around the world want to raise their kids and do something like they're not. Uh... No, but it's not about even wanting to raise. Well, it's about how you raise. You know, it's about like, for example, it's about whether you would want the kids of whoever it is is going to come into your neighborhood to hang out with your kids, whether you can trust that, you know, they'll have similar values. Like it's, I don't think it's that difficult in, you know, once you're actually, once you're actually in a society to see, you know, how are my kids going to interact with these kids? Would I rather have my kids play with these kids or those kids or whatever? Like, I don't think, I don't think think everybody wants to play Lev. Everybody wants to hang out and have a good time. Well, I think, I think the only reason a lot of the time immigrants want to come to the U.S. is because it's a rich nation and they have this American dream fantasy. I don't think if the U.S. was, say, as poor as, say, Argentina, maybe, um, nowadays, I don't think many people go, yeah, I want to go to the U.S. because I believe in uh, all these, um, you know, all this cultural stuff that you have and so on. Mm-hmm. I honestly think if the U.S. became poor, or very downright look, immigration would stop drastically. I think only people, immigrants are very prideful in the US because it's making them money. They have no loyalty to the country, they're opportunists. Like for example, if something very bad happens in England, um, they they don't they don't integrate a lot of the time. You go to Birmingham, you've got entire streets that are ninety percent Muslim, um, and then you've got streets that are entirely ninety percent Chinese and so on that don't mix and don't integrate and don't learn the language. I think you see the same a lot with the US. Some people do integrate just so they can conduct business and so on, but I don't think a lot of them are sitting there reading the constitution in their respective countries going, Yeah, I, I under yeah, this is why I'm going. Yeah, this, this is solely the reason. Wow, I really want to go to uh Costco and I really want to uh you know try um you know LGBT that's something I'm really into yeah what got all the good stuff 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. What the, the average salary is fifty thousand dollars. Don't care about that. It could be pennies, but I want to go for the <laughs> I want to go for beliefs of the U.S. system, and that's why you've got a lot of uh, issues with the U.S., especially with uh, terrorism and people feeling out of place. The natives there, um, the people who you know make up a majority of the country, feel out of place, and that's why most people don't know their next door neighbors. They feel depressed. Mm. A lot of them don't feel like they belong in civil society. That's why big groups of you know communities have collapsed recently because no one is the same i mean i blame the internet to some degree but no one's similar in values anymore like they used to be and well, you, you've outlined something very I feel important like a lot of time immigration well yeah. you've outlined something i think that's extremely important you just said that people don't go through the process of understanding the system of government here, how it works, why is it that this is such a good system? And I'm not just talking about America, I'm talking about England, I'm talking any Western nation, certain things, again, liberalism, things we take for granted. I don't think it's that difficult to institute a kind of system yeah. where that would be one of the big focuses, that the people who come here, it's kind of like when you become Jewish. You know, you have to, it's very hard to be a Jew if you're not like, if your mom's not a Jew. So you have to learn the Torah, you have to learn all of these various traditional things, and then you end up being a better Jew than a lot of the Jews who never had to learn any of this stuff to begin with. But we don't have anything close to that here. So, Miles, I am just pleading with you here to just consider that what I'm proposing would have the same effect, I think, of what you are aiming for, and it would require a lot of work on behalf of the people who actually want to emigrate. It's not a policy of saying, like, hey, anybody who wants to come, you know, feel free. There would be a lot of work. And from what I recall, when my parents came here, there was a lot of work they also had to do. I don't know if the systems changed. Uh, I don't know how much the systems changed since my parents emigrated here. I assume it did change quite a bit. But either way, it was very hard for them to do so. And it was a very stringent interview session that they had with the uh, immigration officials. So all that I'm saying is let's just up the ante when it comes to what the requirements are. But if a person's from some other country like that's in a dictatorship right now and considers themselves to, you know, be a perfect fit for the U.S., let them try. Let them try. I don't think that person is going to be like a make it or break it situation for the U.S. as much as having a lot of people who, let's say, you know, are are not showing any loyalty or any patriotism at all. Mm, I'm not too sure. I think I think sometimes dictatorships can be a good thing, but that's a whole other can of worms I'm not going to go into. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just going to accept the current system right now. I don't think the US has a very bright future, to put it lightly, unless if something drastically changes. And that's why the US goes in cycles of have allowing immigration more and more than suddenly stopping it every few I've got the amount of years now. But it's a clear cycle of anti immigration that appears in the US because they realize, you know, the country is no longer being represented by the original group of people, group identity is left and so on, and civil society is pretty much collapsing, depression rates are rising and people just don't know their neighbors. And yeah. I, I think it's it does depend, but that's yeah. more of a I don't city think thing, uh, you know. Like people in the city don't, uh, you know, they don't knock on everybody in the apartment building's door and get to know people. You know, there's not a, a welcoming committee in, in every building. You know, you don't walk down the street waving at people that you don't know. You ever want to want to really freak people out being a hillbilly in a big city? Just start saying howdy to people. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. They don't like that. Well, they don't I like think... somebody being yeah. friendly. Well, I don't like cities in the first place. I mean, I feel like they're kind of the embodiment of the worst things of the Western world. I mean, that's why most people in cities are very depressed and the cost of mm. living is so high and so on. Um, but there know, also wouldn't have been a... Pizza. Pizza's good. But there also oh, wouldn't have been cheap. a British... Uh, yeah. There also wouldn't have been the British Empire without a city. Like, like it or not, cities are places where a lot of these thoughts are being formulated into bigger plans that's where a lot of organization happens but i agree with mass bastard where in the u.s i think a big problem is that like like miles what exactly fuels a lot of these internet uh rage fests i think a lot of it does come from 
picking the absolute worst aspects of whatever it is society has to offer. So when you go online and when you're talking about like the uh, CRT, the uh, uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, all of that stuff, a lot of it, I think, comes from a minority that is unfortunately, you know, infecting its way into the school system, into the uh, colleges, into the media. We all know that. But as far as the amount oh, of people, yes. yeah. Yes. But, it's but very... it doesn't mean the minority don't have the most influence. I mean, the one percent, the top of world leaders are minority, but they control everything. Correct. Correct. So at the same time, yeah, you could be a minority. You can just be one person, but at the same time, you control everything or have massive influence. So it doesn't matter if it's ten people, ninety nine percent, or whatever in between, or whatever. Um, you know, they should be addressed very harshly. No, I agree. It should be addressed harshly. The only point I'm making here is. How many people do we think are currently under this sh this paradigm shift of never talking with their neighbors, not having a functioning community? Got to be at my, least three or four. Yeah. Well, my my uh, my thing here is <laughs> my thing here is a lot of these things that we hear about on the internet. I think it may come from looking at the worst examples of this being in society while ignoring, like Mass Vassar was talking about, the communities that are functioning, where there are neighbors and there are people who come together and wave hi to each other. I think that thing's uh, still going on today. I can't really say oh, like at course, what yeah. levels, but that's just what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to show that there is some silver lining to living today that maybe because we're always searching for drama we're always searching for what is this thing that i have to stand up against it's almost like we're getting what we expect like if we're always searching for bad news some degree yes but at the same time i think sometimes you have to address realities i mean even i think it was if you surveyed california about 12 years ago 70 percent were against uh, you know gay marriage but nowadays you know it's obviously gone a little bit more extreme so imagine how far it would be in 10 years we can recognize today of course that the minority are just a very small group that are just proposing crazy ideas but then in another 10 years it's not going to be crazy is it? it's going to be the standard and if you don't like it uh you know you're a terrible person and so on and just imagine a hundred years time and you know further on so i think you need to now, there'll quickly. be state enforced homosexuality yeah <laughs> thanks sam Hyde. excellent stuff <laughs> they will beat it into you they find out that you're not walking around with your boyfriend holding hands they'll beat you in the streets <laughs> now uh, we're we are we are going to we're going to have Stardust coming in just in a bit, in 10 minutes. But before that, Mass Bastard, you have the floor. If there are any questions you want to ask Lord Miles, now would be the time. And also, listen, everybody, subscribe right now for Break the Rules. We are going to have tomorrow a very special stream about the uh, NFTs of the uh, Miladies. We're going to be talking about the controversy there because uh, they're talking about there being this, uh, well, Kaliak, I've known Kaliak for a long time. I've had Kaliak people on BTR before, but their whole thing they're saying is that uh, these uh, NFTs are associated with the Kaliak people, and the Kaliak people had like this grooming stuff going on, where I believe there were things of that nature going on within that community. I per se have never been within that particular side of it, and a lot of the people always say, "Well, this guy's a groomer, that guy's a groomer." I had no connection to any of that stuff that was going on back there when I was in the uh, Kaliak Discord. In a way, I think like minds attract like, where there were people who were talking about a lot of esoteric things, and that's what they were doing, and then somewhere else people were doing that that stuff. But either way, I'm going to get to the bottom of what's going on with that grooming situation tomorrow. It's not going to be a softball stream. I am going to be very upfront Playing hardball. About Yes, I'm going to be very upfront about all the things that they're asking there. Because, look, Kaliak was one of the original things in BTR history that uh, created a lot of very fun, controversial uh, streams. So I'm glad that now we can kind of clear the air and find out what exactly went on there that, uh, you know, that just didn't come to people's awareness who were not a part of it back then. But anyway, that being said, Mass Bastard, you have the floor. Whatever you want to ask Lord Miles, ask it. Everybody subscribe, press a like. The likes help the algorithm. So go for it. 
So uh, how do you always happen to be at a place just before a war breaks out? Like, how do you read the tea leaves and know what's going on? Oh, see, um, I work for a deep state organization that pay me stupid amounts of money oh, too, to get huh? intel on different countries. Uh, but yeah, we would pose as uh, <laughs> we would pose as a goofy traveler when I've had extensive training. I'm actually a lot older, hence the hairline. Um, and we would go to different nations and you know watch it collapse and then gather intel. And then we would post about it online just um, as a cover or something goofy traveler so it's, it's really good you know they pay really well um you know they make you do some satanic stuff every once in a while but it's hmm. fine no honestly so i think i'm just that, really uh, that you're unlucky or lucky to be uh, that you're just not a jabroni like beavis and butthead going to war countries like dude war rules you're telling me that's not you i honestly enjoy it a little bit here yeah. i i enjoy it to some degree but then I would join the army. I think if I was in a war zone, I'd be smiling most of the time. Most people would hate that, but it's just the reality of how I deal with things. Um, you know, like when I was in Afghanistan um, about a month ago, um, an ISIS bombing went off in a mosque um, about 500 meters away from me. And I saw, you know, the smoke bellowing from my window. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, here we go again. Um, it wasn't a oh, bro, something's not terribly Andreas, wrong, bro. Oh, gee, I'm going to call the embassy. Mm. yeah it was just like you know, it, it's like if i um just poured something on the floor by accident it's the same reaction i think i become more anxious at the self-checkout was trying to get something to scan than i do in a war oh, zone God. it's really yeah, bizarre but i think i just area i can i can yeah. see it right now please check bagging area make sure all your items are in the yeah. bagging area and then here exactly. comes over the girl with the key like oh yeah. you didn't have your stuff in here i see Exactly. I mean, you have to straight down the barcode on some plastic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't scan. And you look like you're special just trying to scan like this. And even the old people look at you like you're some sort of retard. I'm like, bro, you yeah. can't use it. Um, pick the bag I think up, I'm just looking going down. to these countries. I just researched it going on. And uh, another. Yeah, exactly. Oh, unless, unless I just steal stuff. Yeah. It's a lot easier. Some people do that. Some people. Uh, <laughs> I got a friend. That's what he was telling me the other day. It's like, yeah, I just go in and I steal stuff. I don't care. What are they going to do? I just take the cat food. Well, I did have a, oh, what a I did have a scheme to get free stuff from supermarkets. I, I did the same thing to some degree before I was Catholic for about one year. So what I would do is I would find a bag of pasta that was like 100 grams. Um, and then they would go up in another 100 grams, like 200 grams, like 300 grams for a bag. I would scan the barcode at home and then I would make it into a sticker and I would find something in the store of equivalent weight. So say a steak was 100 grams. I would cover a barcode with this sticker barcode. And when I go to the self-checkout, I would scan it and it would be the same weight. So when you place it in the bagging area, it wouldn't come with any alarms. So I was getting roughly, you know, 50 pounds worth of steak for roughly 30p, 30 cents. So I did that for about a year and I think I saved several thousand. But then it was obviously very bad. So I stopped after I realized, um, well, I always realized both free food. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my scheme. So lovely stuff. Uh, Mass Bastard, is there, unless there's another one, I wanted to ask uh, Miles about, uh, well, back to the cultural questions. What, uh, what big differences do you also see between you and the people that you were around in Afghanistan as far as Yeah, how, what kind of yeah. other people are out there like doing the war tourism thing? Like who's doing that? What, um, what kind of people show up? Is it everybody like a Beavis and Butthead jabroni, or like what are they doing? What are they like? It's, it's either retards or psychopaths. Either retards, psychopaths, beds. So, so Beavis um, and Butthead. You don't meet many people. A lot of them, I, I feel like a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. I See, the only reason I went to Afghanistan, there was two reasons. One, I saw a Drew Binsky video. He's a YouTuber who does travel vlogs. He was like, yeah, bro, it's great here. And then I, I it was COVID, so it was the only country that was open to non-vaccinated. So I went there. And I feel like I was the only person to come out of that, uh, you know, not killed or something. And then I've kind of done the whole thing. And then some people now have done similar things when they've seen someone travel to these dangerous countries to go, oh, bro, the wholesome YouTuber said it's all fine. Let's go. And, you know, they end up getting killed or something. 
So I feel like people see me do it and I'm a bad influence and bad going to dodgy places. Like I met someone in Ukraine who was like, oh, bro, I saw you were here and I just had to come, bro. If you can make it because you're retarded, I can. <laughs> and I was like, so true. Um, I, have, I, I messaged her about two months ago, uh, sorry, a month and a half ago, and they have a message back. And the Twitter's been inactive, so I'm not too sure if they made it out. Oh, no. But we'll see. Um, yeah. So I feel like that's another type of person, the person who just sees an influencer doing it, just has a slightly boring life and decides to go to a war zone instead of going to therapy. Uh, yeah. yeah, we all know the guys yeah. that, uh, you know, last, uh, you, you all our Steam and PlayStation friends, last online nine years ago. It's like, oh, yeah, exactly. man, where's that guy been? What, what's their story? This poor guy. Is- yeah. And uh, as far oh. as yeah, go on. No, sorry, carry on. Uh, no problem. Okay, so as far as the people that you were uh, meeting there in Afghanistan, who were not the tourists but the actual people on the ground, what are some of the other things that uh, you think people in the West may have misconstrued? I'm not talking about the system of government, but the people themselves. Yeah, they big far- comic book yeah. fans. So yeah, yeah. actually, uh, well, I've got a story about that. So. With the comic book fans, one person who I met, to be um, he's incredibly well off in Afghanistan. He's got a PS5 and a 50-inch TV and a nice house. So respect to this guy. But he's asked me to bring some anime into Afghanistan because he can't order it. So oh. I think it's two, it's four hundred dollars per kilogram to order from a delivery company for the West. It's insane. But then when you meet other people as well. One misconception is that everyone has met a Western person or at least a soldier at this point because the country was occupied and they just they've all seen Westerners. No, most people have never seen a, U- a U.S. soldier because the U.S. invaded Kabul and got you know claimed it very easily, and then they went on the outskirts and went into the mountains and so on. So most people, when I was walking around and speaking English, they were like, "Bro, he's British, bro! Whoa!" You know, I was like a museum expedition with these people. So they started touching my hair and feeling up my arm. And, you know, uh, you know it was pretty dodgy. Uh, I felt like I was getting molested a little bit. But, you know, mm. it was just, they were amazed by me. Anybody um, ask you if you use that same accent when you're home all alone? You just turn off the British accent? <laughs> uh, no, no. Or do you think I can change it? Um, when I when I speak Hello, to people I'm, in Afghan... I'm Lord Neil Miles yeah. Hello. <laughs> That's very sorry. But, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I won't say what you sound like to me, but it's all good. But um, oh god, I sound like Dave the Redneck Schultz from nineteen uh, eighties. Yeah, the same guy that slapped John Stossel. That's, that's kind of a good I thing sound to sound like. like I, mm. I mean, that's a good thing to sound like. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of the time when I speak to them, I speak to them in simple sentences with a certain brute force to the accents, and for some reason, it always resonates better. If I speak to people in Afghanistan like this. You know, they, they just like whatever. But if I go, oh, very nice, like how much, how much, very good price for me. I'm a foreigner. Give me good price. They they resonate with that. So that's very bizarre. Um, you have to sound like you're from Turkey, maybe or Romania. Um, that's one misconception. And another thing is uh, that it's very backwards in the country. They've got full 4G coverage at a very cheap price across the whole of Kabul, Herat, Masharif, and uh, Kandahar because the US installed it. So they've got excellent roads, excellent internet infrastructure with very fast internet. Um, I would say faster than most parts of the US um, and so on. So, so it's, it's very bizarre because they have no one to maintain it. online all day, all, every day. They can just live on the internet too, just like us. Yeah, exactly. That's mm. great. Culture. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. it has a bright future. The, you know the Christian, yeah. You know the Christian I met um, in Afghanistan. He became Christian because he watched a dark. He watched um, oh, what's it called um, you know that song where they play um a video of a Christian, uh, dark age mindset. That's it, right? Mm, no, you know I... that you know that song where they play over a montage of Christian images and and you know everyone says his base. You haven't seen those types of memes, right? No. Um, no, I don't know anything part about of memes. I've never, never heard mind, of these but he, memes. He What are these memes? He, he, looked, he looked at... No, no. He, no, no. He looked at a Christian shit post and he became Christian just from looking on Twitter. You know you know how insane that is? I mean, the internet's really influential over there. You get some people that get into niche things in mm-hmm. Afghanistan and then they learn the entire history of 
um, I don't know, Kazakhstan in the 14th century, and they just know everything about it because of the internet. So mm. if you talk to someone in Afghanistan, despite the 40% literacy rate, you know, some people are just geniuses in certain topics, which I think is really bizarre. Um, like the, the, um, the guy I was speaking to, um, the one that was Christian, he knew everything about anime just because he got internet in yeah, 2009. That's, that's what I was getting ready to say is what kind of anime are they into that's a wide brush to paint mm. with like you could say you like cartoons but there's a big mm. difference between yes. fritz the cat and looney tunes like those well, are if two i could very take a guess things. if oh. i could take a guess i think they'd be into dragon ball z but yep. i don't dragon know ball, I, dragon ball z i bet was the north star was, i bet you they <laughs> love fist of the north star that was one of the things I will find um, the name of one of the things he wanted me, um, me to get to. What, was it called? Your, uh, what, well, what else is hot now? I, I don't know if you guys have seen those Dragon Ball Z fan arts by this uh, Egyptian guy where he draws like all the DBZ characters as Muslims. And like he puts oh, uh, he puts Chi Chi, he, he covers her in the burqa, and he has like Go, Goku and Gohan <laughs> praying on the rug, you know, with their hands up, and Master oh, Roshi. Master Roshi becomes like their imam, you know, like he's like the head of the mosque. And uh, yeah, it is. But I can understand that because I, I think that there's a lot of people like I think a lot of people, especially, you know, like uh, in the American uh, ghetto, I know, whatever you want to call it, like, you know, in the, in the urban part of the American uh, life. I think what attracts them to uh, Dragon Ball Z uh, is this emphasis on honor on manliness on qualities that i think unfortunately a lot of more spoiled parts of the american population have uh, discarded just because maybe there's just not as much of a pressure well, to I can tell you why up. dragon ball is popular because it's cool it's a cool story people like the yeah it's exploding thing yes yeah. guys shoot fireballs out of their oh, hands uh, the lab. Was, that's universal I, found the I don't care who you are in this world you can watch that show in fully in a totally other language and get it. This guy's angry at this guy for whatever reason, and they're shooting fireballs at one another for the next ten episodes. Mm -hmm. He's got to power up. Yeah, Everybody loves cool power. Muscle. Like they, they they did research yeah, in the eighties oh, here in America the uh, the He Man toys. Yeah, and that was what their focus group found that every kid they all wanted the power. And so He Man, when he says his thing, is I have the power and lifts up the sword. And that's what Dragon Ball is. It's guys who literally have power levels yelling at one another. Uh, like that's that's that, that, that's very core to human beings. Oh, this guy's he's more powerful than him. But when he fires up into his this isn't even his final form. Once hmm. he powers up, he'll be able to kick this guy's ass. Oh, and uh, Lord Miles, what were you saying? I found the book. It was Berserk. Um, and oh, also Dragon Ball Z. Good yes. stuff. Yeah, See, I've never heard of this. I'm not. Taste. I'm not into the anime scene too much. I've got a friend who's obsessed with anime, and he's he's never he's he's never been in a relationship, and he has a body pillow. And I just don't want. I just don't want to go down that route. I feel they like have those guys in uh, the UK as well. Yeah, the Dragon Ball yeah, Z many. to uh, the Berserk to body pillow uh, pipeline. You don't want to go down that. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, it is it is quite something, though, when you think about it. When you have, like, anime and then you have hentai, you know, you have the ability to create out of nowhere these fictional women that you can now consider to be of a sexual interest and never have to go outside, never have to meet another woman, and that's it. You know, you're just, uh, that's going to be your life from now on. And there are people out there who are, uh, who are like that. And uh, in England... Lord Miles, do you see a lot of young men going through these kind of problems? Did you also go through similar? I mean, you did have quite a bit of uh, unadulterated uh, free sex before you became Christian. So, what do you yeah. see as what? Well, what do you see as being more uh, prevalent? Prevalent? Do you see kind of like the pre-Christianity Lord Miles? being all randy and hot and bothered and going around with every lass? Or do you see now this more of a tendency to be indoors, go on the internet, jack it to hentai? Like, which direction do you think more young men are going to be going to? Because as far as I see, less young men are having sex today than before. Yeah, I would say 20% are the ones that have regular sex and go outdoors. And, you know, it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy. If you have a lot of sex, you're motivated to work out. And if you work out, you look big, you're attractive, you have sex and so on. But if you have a bad start to life and your parents kind of 
make you grow up on an iPad and you discover, you know, Discord and you get groomed and so on. You go down that pipeline, you would honestly just become one of those incel types that you know don't know how to talk to women, or over socialize the men, under socialize the women. And you know, eighty percent of them that I've met are just like that. I met some guys who are like, oh, geez, bro, I don't know why girls are like me. You know, I'm like really fat and I've never washed my face and I've never done anything impressive. I don't know why the supermodel just isn't interested in me, bro. They just don't understand. And I feel like a lot of guys just kind of become a little bit autistic and fall for the, oh, anime women just talk like that in real life, 100%. Why why can't I find them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, There's a lot of guys that have absolutely people. no game whatsoever that think the world works like it does in cartoons and romantic comedies. Well, speaking yeah, of like women as well. Well, speaking of women, yeah. we have the wonderful Stardust joining Break the Rules once again. Stardust, it's always a pleasure to have you on. How are you? How's that whole uh, kerfuffle with uh, what's her name? Kefuls. The Kefuls thing going. You got a kerfuffle going. with Kefuls? Be careful with that kerfuffle. <laughs> Can can we hear you, Stardust? Are you there? Is everything okay with the audio? Is it happening again? Last time, the oh, same no. thing happened. Don't worry, oh, because you muted her before it hey, happened, Simon? and she addressed it. And there's not going to be any problems. Hello? Hello, there Hello. we go. There we go. I was yes. on the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Okay. No, no uh, problem hi. at all. Hello. Um, so how's hello. the kerfuffle with Keffels going? Uh, uh, it's going okay. Um, I'm in the okay, process the of getting canceled 30 different ways. So uh, we'll see how okay. it goes, I guess. Yeah. It's fun yeah. being canceled. Yeah. You have if you get canceled, you do something right. Yeah. I guess so. I guess so. It's just a little bit tiring after a while, right? Like, it, you know, I, oh, I would like I, it to stop. I'd like to have a break. But I have know. such fun playing heel. If you can enjoy playing a heel... The internet is a wide open sea for you to just enjoy it and sail it and live for it and thrive in it. Mm, yeah. Indeed. So, uh, Stardust, the original inspiration for me to bring you on was a video you did about Lord Miles here in the flesh. So I'm curious, first off, what kind of questions you would have for Lord Miles? And then I want to reach back to the conversation I had with him. I don't know if you were watching yeah. before about the immigration. Uh, curious what you think of that. So anyway, Stardust, uh, go for it. Let, me, let Lord yeah, Miles know. I guess yeah. first question I have for you is, do you have a death wish? Huh? Um, maybe. I don't know. I If I would, I would go to Dangerous Nations. Um I don't know. I, I think I think I like to dance on the line a little bit. I honestly find it fun. I think I'd feel a little bit too bored if I didn't. Okay. All right. What originally inspired you to uh, go there in the first place? So you mean in August uh, when the Taliban took over? To, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. So this was the height of COVID, and yeah, so it was the height of COVID. Um, you need a vaccine to go anywhere. I wasn't going to get it. It still happens. Um, I found a way around it. But at the time, you needed a vaccine to go anywhere. The only place you didn't need one was Afghanistan. And I watched a few mm. videos uh, from YouTube on Afghanistan. And I was like, you know, it's it's pretty peaceful in central Kabul and the outskirts. Yeah. should be fine uh -huh. at the moment. And I was looking at online. Every single security analyst said it was fine. The US, UK, NATO governments, you know, were all saying it's it's okay. Even the people on the ground, the tour guide I spoke to said, Yeah, it's fine. So the yeah. embassy. So I thought before I graduate and work a really tiring, you know, modern job, I'm just gonna go on a little wacky adventure. So I, I mm -hmm. felt like a calling for it almost. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So you did like a Dora the Explorer, but with like the Taliban basically. Um, so you, you, you were yeah, talking no, no, about, yeah. he had a map, he had a map stardust. <laughs> nice. Um, so anywhere. you talked yeah. about how a lot of the people there are similar to people in the West, like how the young men there are similar in a lot of ways to the young men in the West. Did you have any interactions, with, interactions with any of the women there? Yeah, quite a bit. Um, so I spoke to them in private. Um, a lot of them were just chilling on the streets, um, selling stuff sometimes. Um, I asked their husbands, they said, yeah, they could speak, blah, 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 so on. Um, I asked them a few questions. Um, they said it was quite good. Um, 
they said some good things regarding the situation. Some expressed concerns. Some just didn't want to speak too much about it. But overall, mm. mixed sentiment. Mm. Okay. Um, so has your trip there kind of influenced how you view like international intervention, things like that? And, and how has it, um, how's your experience there also like influenced your views regarding like women, in, like women's, um, rights in like third world nations and things like that? Yeah. So I honestly, I do really like Afghanistan. That's why I'm going back in about two months. I'm going to the embassy tomorrow as well to get another visa. Um, so it's it's a loaded question. I would say it hasn't changed my views too much because I understand it's a very strict Muslim nation. I do understand it's not going to be very liberal mm -hmm. um, in its stances towards women. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to go along with it, even though obviously I don't agree with Muslims. And I'm very Catholic about things. If I could change it with a snap of fingers, I would. But it's it's not my world, and yeah, you know, maybe I can help some people in smaller ways. But you know, if I got start speaking out against it uh, massively, it's not going to help anyone at the end of the day. Um, international relations, I think it's a bit too complex. It's beyond me. Um, people have studied it for forty something years and still get it wrong. Hence the analysts be wrong about the invasion of Kabul and so mm -hmm. on. So I have my own personal opinions. And it has formed a little bit and some of them are conflicting mm -hmm. because different situations and so on. But generally, yes, okay. um, opinions do sway a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard about the Taliban ordering women to wear head to toe clothing in public, right? Oh, yeah, that, that definitely does not happen. Um, yeah. When I was there, when they ordered that, um, people were just walking around. I saw several women with their hair fully out. Um, and they weren't mm. young ones, you know, nine years old or so. They were um, teenage age, sometimes early 20s and so on. You saw some of the northern uh, provinces, people, Tajiks and everything. Mm. They had their hair out. A lot of them just had normal burkas on, normal headscarves. Um, well, it looks, like this crazy was just, it looks like this was just announced like May 7th that that oh, yeah, requiring... yeah oh you were still there okay um okay yeah. yeah do you think it will change when you when you visit again only one way to find out i think it'll be I a guess. little bit stricter it, it yeah. is some things too that um it's like the taliban haven't spoke out, spoken out against wearing jeans but no one dares to out of fear that they'll get in trouble even though jeans are fully allowed um so it's a really confusing situation uh, because sometimes there's a lot of things that are said to be rules, but they aren't enforced and you can see it whilst walking around and you know, same the other way as well. It's like mm -hmm. the West in some regard, um, like with jaywalking and so on. Obviously, different mm -hmm. severities, but same sense. Most heinous mm -hmm. crime, jaywalking. Um, so if they, if you go there again and exactly, you see that... Exactly, execution. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to... Uh... Um, I was just going to ask him um, if you go there again and you see everybody now is, is, is actually covered from head to toe wearing face coverings, what would you think of that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, kind of cringe. It's not Catholic, but at the same time, you know, I got respect. It's their culture. It's how Muslims work. I can't suddenly start walking around, ripping out my hair going, oh, bro, this is terrible, bro. Take it off. Take it off. You mm. can't do this. I bet this people, is, you know, I can't start spouting. I bet people I mean, would think it was weirder if they were dressed head to toe in fursuits, like full on mascot costumes everywhere they went. People would have a much stronger kind of reaction. Uh, one day the furries well, are going to have be, a separatist I, I colony. Yeah. There are Muslim nations that don't require women to wear uh, face coverings like that, right? There are Muslim yeah. nations that don't require women to cover head to toe. Uh, so well, very, the way that cool. Taliban is doing it is, is different, right? Uh, they're significantly stricter with it. Um, and I guess I would just, I would ask what, um, like, what are your personal opinions on that? What are your personal opinions on, on women being required to be covered? Well, there is a good argument for it made by the Taliban and other Muslim countries as well. And you do have countries that are lukewarm towards certain religions and so on, such as the U.S., um, you know, uh, U.S. Catholics basically being half pro-abortion, half not with 
you know, whichever um, way they feel on the day, uh, hence the outrage by some Catholics where I think it was Nancy Pelosi, that's her name. She was uh, banned from communion, but everyone speak out against it, even though they're meant to be Catholic. Same things are Muslims in some ways. Um, there's a good argument that they should have head coverings if you reference all the literature. And I think there's a lot of people that are very well educated in Afghanistan, people that have multiple PhDs in the subjects in Islamic studies, um, and they are Western educated to some degree because of the exchange of information and they still advocate for it so I can understand the argument both ways but at the same right. time obviously I'd be against it but yeah it's not my so I the the I've talked to people who are are educated in it as well who have said that there's nothing in the Quran that says about um the only thing that it says is that women should have clothing from head to toe right it doesn't say that they should need to cover their faces that they should need to cover their hair things like that right um so so I think it, it's a difference in interpretation. And there are other Muslim countries out there that don't require it, although there are women who still wear like the hijab in those countries. Um, but I do think that um, I do think that there's plenty of contention, even within the Islamic world, about uh, about whether women should be required to cover their faces. Um, so I guess I I. You said if you if you could well, snap your fingers you and change things like uh, you would. What what kind of changes would you make if if you were there? And you oh, were I don't want to go on rants, but the the entire world would be very Catholic. Um, and if I could well, change anything, about Afghanistan. Uh, every, oh yeah, the entire country would be Catholic. Yeah, like with any country. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I and mean, everyone be prosperous, and everyone have have you know mm. streets paved. For gold but uh, but wouldn't that be? Sport. But wouldn't wait, that wait, be stepping? Same, okay. But what yeah, about at the same the time too? You said. Wait. Wait. You said it's not in the Quran, but at the same time, you know, it's like it's, a lot of things are not in the Bible, but you can extrapolate it from texts and scholars and so on, and that's why some people dedicate mm. twenty years of their life to try to understand some stuff, mm -hmm. and then you can say, well, I spoke to someone else who's educated on the matter and so on, but then you know it's just kind of he say she say against experts, so I can understand why an entire country of several million agree with a certain sentiment and several million disagree, um, but there is a basis of women should be covered in mm. in um, in Muslim nations. Um, right. If you, if you were, had the ability to change that while you were there or like snap your fingers and change that, that women were not required to do that. Would you do that? Yeah. Like I said, it would all become Catholic. Mm. Okay. But, uh, just to step in here for a bit, uh, Lord Miles, when you're talking about the women becoming uh, Catholic, then that is kind of stepping on their culture. And that's the contradiction I pointed out before, that on one hand, you respect the kind of culture that they have, but at the same time, if given the chance, you wouldn't be opposed to kind of changing it. So it goes to this idea of how much influence should people have on cultures like this? Like, should we just leave it alone, let it do whatever uh, they're doing? Or actually, if you see a better way out, step in there and figure out a better way that these people can live. So, yeah, who among us is the one oh, no, who's I'm, going I'm to tell the scared. Japanese not to be perverted with their cartoons and movies? Exactly. Like their I mean, perversion look, comes, is their culture. When it comes, oh, me, when it comes to like, women's... They're like five foot four, the Japanese are. Oh, no, 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 okay, well, yeah, forget easy, the Japanese. Pal, For, forget the Japanese. Go. Not, I don't care about cartoons. Yeah. When we're talking well, about yeah. half yeah. of the population... Yeah. Half of the population, which is like, which is like, you know, women, right? Or which are half of the population. I do care. And I do think regardless of culture, okay. people can, people should be advancing the rights for women um, internationally. You can do that while still respecting cultures. Well, no, the culture is basically women wearing headscarves. That is the culture in Afghanistan. I think so you that can't respect culture, the culture, which is their beliefs, and then change the culture, which is their beliefs. I would like to believe that the culture in Afghanistan is much more rich than just being boiled down to the woman wearing uh, head coverings. I think it's much more rich than that. And I think oh, yeah, that... but we won't talk about all the culture. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. agreeing with you, but well, we're talking about the head scarf, not being Again, if half of right. the population is subjected to an unfair standard that the other half doesn't have to, to meet, then I think that there's an issue there. It's not even just half of the uh, population. Oh, no, it's it's, it's also. 
just what just to be clear that's having the men dress up in the full burkas too mm, everybody's exactly. always dressed up you know what? everybody I might be okay with covered. that yeah no, but just to be uh, just to be clear though, wait, 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 wait real quick, hats. real quick, just to be clear though, when we're talking about Afghanistan, we're not talking about one group. We're talking about the Pashtuns, but other than the Pashtuns, there are other groups who dress in an entirely different way. Yeah. So, Lord Miles, you must have met some of them as well. Really a country. Yeah, Afghanistan's not really a country; it's just a giant tribal community that has been forced together um, through you know other countries being nearby, threatening to invade, so they had to kind of band together. Um, you know, on an easy piece, and now that's why there's conflicts. Um, after all the Americans have left, um, you know, it's it's not really a peaceful nation, unfortunately. But it's a very complex topic. At the same time, I I would invite you to come with me. I'm going in about one month. I will help you get the visa if you want to go and spout against it. Um, I'll obviously get the visa done for you the same night if you agree right now. Um, you come to Afghanistan with or without me and we can go to the Taliban and we can talk this through um, if you believe so strongly in it, you know, in women's rights. Uh, well, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to understand. I don't think it would be safe for me to go there, but, um, but I would ask you. But, but you, it's so important to believe in women's rights. You should, you know, if, sure. it, if it's really something you really stand for and something important, I would also, I would take a risk, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's your duty almost, you know. I um I I agree with that, but I think there's also plenty of women's um, issues to be advanced even domestically and even in other countries. But what I'm asking, what I would ask of you is, you're saying that you are into this, like you're you want hardcore Catholicism, but you don't want to touch other cultures. Yeah. Um, so you, yeah. would you say that your position is all cultural practices are equally valid? No, of course not. Some some cultures are very worse than others. Some are primitive and backwards and terrible for humanity. AEW fans, got it. Yeah, but I mean, the, like you said, the I mean, some are Japanese. Uh, there's a subculture of basically uh, fucking children. Uh, excuse my language, but that's what it is. Would you say mm -hmm. that's equal to, uh, you know, I don't want to say Catholicism because I want to make the joke about the priests, but, uh, you know, equal to, uh, let's say, um, Christians in general. There's some cultures that are not good, like, you know, the tribes that eat people, you know, camelism and so on. Yeah. And there's some tribes where they just make human sacrifices. And if you can agree that those aren't as good, you can extrapolate that for every other culture until you decide which cultures are the best. It's a controversial take saying that eating people and human <laughs> sacrifice is wrong. Like, that's their I culture, mean... pal. I mean, I think, that, yeah, I think I <laughs> think you uh, can respect other the cultures, US elite. but there's still certain cultural practices that we can acknowledge are are not valid, right? That are no longer valid. But that's um, not respecting them. But I'm that's sorry? not respecting them. I think it is. I that's think not you can respecting respect cultures. If you, if there is a practice like, within like that if culture, if that's. Like a, I want to make sure like, you guys don't speak over each other. Yeah. So, uh, Miles, you go and then yeah, start. Sorry, there's, there's a delay yeah. here. There's yeah. a delay here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go on. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if you respect a culture, you don't alter it to some degree uh, to meet your own. So, for example, I don't. I'm not going to walk up to the uh, tribe that eats one out every four children because it makes them stronger and go. You know what? I respect your culture. It's you know, it's your thing. You know, you're eating innocent children, but. You know, you do you because everyone must be accepted. It must be all equal. But, um, you know, you do you. And then I'll say I disagree with it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. No, no. Even though I see it as completely evil and backwards. I'm just going to sit here and whine. Um, but you do you. I respect it, but I don't like it. But I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, it's kind of passive almost. Like if I don't like something, I will be actively against it in my words and also in my actions to some mm -hmm. degree. Um, as mm. much as I can do, where I don't get executed, um, yeah. which I've presented a lot in my history. But you, know, you can't talk about something and actually not do something about it. Sure. So, like for example, um, like like a, one cultural practice that that I think is um, is not valid is like um, FGM, right? Uh, and What's I that, think sorry? that uh, female genital mutilation um, and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some some cultures still practice that, um, but I don't think it's valid. They can practice other parts of their culture, but I don't think that part of that culture is valid by any means. 
Um, and I think it, uh, I think it should only be like, people should just be advocating that that's something that people shouldn't practice anymore. Um, just like, um, uh, I don't know. I personally am, I, I don't have a problem with like, um, like a hijab, like a head covering, but like when it is putting this barrier over a woman's face, I do, I can't look at that and not find it inherently oppressive. Yeah. I think the same with face masks, but, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, you can't pick and choose what you want in the culture. Same with religion. If you believe in God, you will not pick and choose, you know, what you read and believe in and practice. Mm. Uh, you won't say, well, you know, X, Y, Z, I, I won't do this, but I won't feel like this. You kind of have to stick to the entire thing. And oh, if you pick that, that, that is yeah. way wrong, pal. You. you don't know Christians in America, brother. There's a lot of oh, them I know what you mean. Choose. Yeah. Listen, yeah, man, I know guys that I eat shrimp those. every That's day, yeah. every every so, Wednesday on senior day, they go and eat their yeah. shrimp and laugh about it, and never even consider that eating shellfish is against the holy word of God. How mm. dare they? Oh, thank you. That's the Old Testament, so it's no longer valid. Mm. But if uh, a religion, oh, uh, but, I, I, but if a religion does include a human sacrifice or eating kids, like we talked about before, you would say objectively that that is wrong. Why not apply the same thing to women covering their uh, bodies fully with this uh, outfit? Oh, I agree. But then again, what, what are you going to do about it, truthfully? All right, Stardust, what, 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 what are you going to do yeah, about it? What are you going to do about it, Stardust? How do we stop it? I don't you know. I'm just, uh, just asking. Can we do some canings? I feel canings? Like we can I think cane. they already do <laughs> we that. We can solve I think they already our problems with canings. Yeah. No, but see, this one is... thing I'll say about their culture that I really like is that they'll cane somebody to help teach I think, them not to do I, wrong. I do, I do have a fundamental disagreement, though. I don't think that... Um, to respect a culture, you need to adopt every single practice within it. Um, you can respect um, every part of a culture, um, except for the one part, one practice that you find abhorrent, right? And that doesn't mean that you're throwing out the entire thing. It means we've moved past the point. We have like advanced and realized that this practice is no longer something that we should be doing. Uh, and and mm -hmm. we can move past it, right? So no, I I feel like, yeah, I feel like if you basically had control, over, let's say you were president of Afghanistan somehow, whatever, and you just straight out say, yeah, no more, no more face coverings, but everything else is cool, they're gonna stone you in the streets. They're gonna drag you out. They're not gonna accept that ever. So you know, you can say, oh, you know, uh, peace and love, uh, just one small aspect of your culture. They're not gonna have it. So they're, mm. they're gonna be ripping you apart. Unless you like, become an iron-fisted dictator, like a, <laughs> unless happened. unless you become an iron-fisted dictator like Muammar Gaddafi. If you get enough power that you keep people in line, that's what I've noticed like with Saddam's Iraq, places like that, where people were able to, like women, were able to have more leeway as far as how they're able to dress. A lot of the more uh, Bronze Age stuff was kind of uh, thrown under. And, and I think the starts. only yeah, well, and I think the only way to Canings. maintain something like that in a population where the majority may actually be in favor of this very tyrannical rule over women would be through having an iron-fisted dictator. And I'm not saying that's great, but I'm just seeing like what are the alternatives here if we want to maintain this kind of society? Like even Iran, you know, under uh, the uh, pre-revolutionary system, you know, women can wear whatever they wanted, but there was also a secret police, there was a dictator, there was all that stuff. And maybe I think uh, given a few years, both for Afghanistan or for Iran, if they wouldn't have gotten rid of the Shah, maybe there would have been enough education that there would be a majority of people that would have been all for that and we wouldn't have the situation we have today. But that takes time. It doesn't just happen like that. But I don't know. That's that's at least how I look at it. I don't know, Stardust, what, what do you think? Um, yeah, uh, again... Um... Maybe I I don't know I think uh, I think the example of female genital mutilation is like an ex a great example right like I can respect the the culture in which that comes from but I don't respect that one practice and um and I and just because it's from a, a culture that I'm not a part of doesn't mean I'm going to throw my hands up and say uh well you know it's 
uh, it's their culture. And I, and you know what, I'm not going to say anything about it because I don't want to impose, you know, anything on their culture. And I don't want to make, uh, you know, I'm mm. not, that's me not being accepting of a culture. Right. No, but, but, but I, I think like, miles is coming from, from more of a yeah. perspective of not that this is good or bad, but more of what are the practical solutions here? Cause even if he agrees with you, okay, now yeah. what, how do we actually go about changing this? Mm. I'm saying the only way to do it is, is with an iron fisted dictator in a lot of these regions and no other way, uh, or just having some kind of a forever american western presence like the old british empire you know they ended up getting rid of the uh burning of the widows that's one mm -hmm. example so i think just like having some kind of a system like that is the only way to guarantee sometimes that, equality yeah. does take enforcement yeah, yeah. canings i'm like, glad we all agree that i'm right about these canings we can just Oh, well, we didn't even get to the i'm not uh, trying to uh i'm not trying yeah. to be difficult here you know I, i'm I, i'm just asking you know so yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. But uh, I don't know, like Lord Miles, do you agree I mean, if, then? If, yeah. Go on. Sorry, do I agree with? Well, yeah, obviously, I'm on the side that I want everyone to you know, be walking around freely and I want a nice, happy Catholic or Christian society where you know um, everyone has some liberty, but it's not degeneracy. You know, I mean, that's some sort of Catholicism quite a bit, you know, if you look at it fundamentally. But, uh, you know, if we just whine about it on... Twitter or social media or wherever. It's not making a solution, it's just bitching basically constantly, unless if you act against it. Like uh, for example, the Ukraine situation, most people are just saying, oh bro, Ukraine seems really bad, bro. I'm gonna put uh, <laughs> an emoji in my Twitter bio and that's gonna make a difference. It did make no difference. So I just went there myself, bought a car, drove the front lines and drove some people out. And mm -hmm. most people who uh, you know, didn't like, uh, you know, didn't like what was going on in Ukraine, got mad because they realized their actions had no influence. So if you really want to do something in Afghanistan, it will be mm -hmm. difficult and most likely you would die. But honestly, raising an army, overthrowing a country, doing some dodgy stuff, you could really make a difference that way. Like That's why the US uh, Constitution is written up. If you want to overthrow a, a dictatorship, a tyrannical government, or some really backward system, you honestly could. Um, same with South Sudan. I estimated you'd only need about five million pounds to overthrow the entire country and take it for yourself. Um, you know, you could do that if you really wanted, if you disagreed with the country that much. But it, unless if we take action, there's there's nothing really happening. Um, I, mean, I think advocacy and I don't think, means something, right? It, I mean, it just feels like we're just jerking off our own morals it's constantly. Uh, like, oh, I agree I on this and so. I'll do this. But I'm I think. I think vocally disagreeing is is some type of pushback. I don't think that's completely useless. I think it's spreading of a, an idea, the planting of a seed can be um, a huge impact on people. I mean, until the ideas are caned out of people, they're just going to always You're really be going there. back to the caning thing, huh? You I'm really thinking, like that I'm one. going all in on yeah. caning. <laughs> I am. Uh, you can consider yeah. me Kane today. I am yeah. Mr. Kane. Wait until we get to the abling. <laughs> but uh, that's right. But anyway, uh, Stardust, if you were, we were talking before, like if Lord Miles was in charge, what if you were in charge, not so much of Afghanistan proper, but in charge of more, you know, like going up the ranks of Biden's or Trump's or whoever's administration, and you were in charge of the policy that would be set there, what were some of the, th what yeah, was, what's Queen yeah. Stardust do? Yeah. Queen Stardust, okay. Mm. Uh, I think there needs to be a universal option for healthcare at the very least. Um, so some sort of universal option for healthcare um, that just seems like a very basic thing that uh, that generally like is accepted even among like healthcare professionals should be a thing. Um, so that's something that I, I would care a lot about. Um, as far as like other stuff, I think um, there are some things we could do with zoning uh, and housing mm -hmm. to um, uh, to create more housing units for people and bring down prices. So you're a yimbyist. Um, you want people to live in the pods? Yeah. You want I to eat the bugs? No, but, yeah. but I meant less uh, domestic policy. I meant less domestic policy, though, and more foreign policy. Because if, yeah, we're, foreign sticking, policy. if we're sticking... If we're sticking... Well, well, no, hold on, hold on. Just to make sure. I'm not talking about general foreign policy. The subject has been right now the uh, situations in the third world countries like Afghanistan, as far as women's rights, things like that. So if you were in charge of that whole thing, what would be your approach? Because Miles' approach from what I understand, is either conquer them to establish like a Catholic uh, society or do nothing. So uh, what would your approach be as far as dealing with uh, countries like Afghanistan? So we we already do a thing with like, for example, like um, 
like um, indentured servitude and things like that. Not indentured servitude. I'm trying to remember the name for it. But basically, um, uh, slave labor. We do this with slave labor, where we will we will um, we will sub we will uh, uh, subsidize um, countries. We will buy from countries and from specific industries within those countries that we know are not using slave labor. Um, and then uh, and we will like pay good rates for it versus um, if we know that there is uh, there is an, an industry within a country that is exploiting slave labor will often stop buying from that country um, and will will uh, or not from from that country specifically, but from that specific um, group within that country in that industry, right? Um, because what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're not like completely destroying um, an industry within a country. So so I think that you can do similar things with like um, rewarding good practices, rewarding um, uh, like equality for women or, or, or striving towards equality for women, right? Um, so um, yeah, buying from uh, from countries industries within countries that we know are like mm. employing women uh, and giving them a fair wage um uh you know um rewarding countries that are making advances in women's rights uh with um with you know funding like we we already do these kinds of things i think that that's generally mm. a pretty good practice i got i gotta step in here one second and ask you about saudi arabia so as you know mm. the u.s is saudi arabia's second largest trading partner and yeah. we've been very tight Yet they have this policy which uh, doesn't really get addressed where they have these guest workers who come in from Southeast Asia. They get their visas yeah. taken away. And from what I heard, they're treated like absolute crap. Yeah. They're treated like slaves. Uh, we don't do anything about it. So it's almost mm -hmm. kind of like w we're not addressing what is uh, one of we our should, closest we partners We should be addressing there. that. Yeah, we should be addressing that. Um, we do it in other countries where, we'll again, we'll buy from uh, specific industries that we know are, are employing people fairly. Um, I think we should be doing that with Saudi Arabia, mm. too. I'm not saying that's nothing, but it's in comparison to what's going on with Afghanistan. Afghanistan may be one of those more autarky type countries where they would have a little help from China, maybe, or from other countries that want to deal with the Taliban. So, you know, I'm not saying it's nothing to do a strategy like that, but I'm not really seeing it affect uh, Afga a country like Afghanistan that much. See, he's holding up. The, fl the Taliban flag right now, oh, in case boy. you're wondering what oh, that my. was. Uh, what the... Wow. Um, I think so. I, to them, but yeah. I think when it when it um, comes to that, um, uh, where was I? I was going to say something, but I forgot. You had brought up RoboCop. I did not bring up Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. What are we about to mention? Uh, WWE, <laughs> what, Saudi what is, Arabia show. What is going to be? What is going to be the highest uh, level thing of the United States could do to change things there? Because we're out of there. I guess the question is: yeah. Should should our policy be going into countries when we can, setting up some kind of world police situation like the British Empire of old used to do? Like I'm talking like broad strokes here, because these things they may have a certain effect, but it's it's a very small piecemeal effect, especially for the Afghanistan. I don't really see, especially with China, that it's going to affect it at all. But I don't know. So, uh, so I I think I think it's. Uh, you know, we we are things we already do. Like I said, like um, uh, uh, countries that abide by our values, we invest in them, we give them aid, things like that. Um, as far as Afghanistan uh, and other countries aiding them, um, I feel like that's very hard. As Miles uh, correctly said, you know that it is a very like um, tribalistic country, right? Um, uh, so uh, so it is. I don't even know if the um, one one question I would have actually is is if the leadership you think do, do you think the leadership there represents the population well right um, uh, so it, it's really going to come down like I'm not really into going in somewhere by force and establishing a police necessarily I do think that um, positive rewards for good behavior are always a, a good idea um, yeah it just it seems like a way you know change comes gradually basically so when it comes to like phasing out slave labor, right? The reason why 
we don't pull out entirely of a country when they're using slave labor and we instead maybe shift where we're buying from within that country um, uh, is because we don't want to completely collapse that country, right? Uh, uh, we don't want to completely collapse an industry within that country. So um, what you do is is you, um, you shift who you're buying from, right? You reward the people who are abiding by your values and you, uh, um, you don't um, reward the people who are using slave labor. It's essentially the same kind of stuff, right? Well, Miles, what do you think? Do you think that this could be a direction we could go on? Yeah, you know what? I think I think we can come together and say slavery bad. Very true. Um, you know, I think I wouldn't buy from some slaves uh, or do any business with slave owners. Uh, there goes my sweatshop in Afghanistan idea, but okay. Um, you know, I guess we can put economic pressure on some countries, but then it's a slippery slope where we do invest in some countries because they don't have uh, pee pee poo poo but sex uh, rights or stuff like that. So um, I think. Uh, on the very it's, base, it's I guess uh, on a very base level, though, like it does take time to phase things out. And and slavery is not something that's like um, cut and dry. You know, a lot of people end up in like forced uh, forced labor, you know, uh, without realizing that they're quite literally slaves. Um, so uh, I think, uh, you know, it's something that you phase out slowly. But I think you need to like actually focus on like basic basic rights. Right. Like the most basic level rights. And if people are being forced um, into labor, uh, and they are, they feel like they're, um, bound by contract to continue providing labor for an exorbitantly cheap price and working terrible hours. Um, yeah, we need to do something about that, right? Just like we need to do things about women's rights. And if a country makes, um, good strides in women's rights, I, I, we should reward them for that. We're like we daddy of the world. Them. Yeah, that that's that's that that's going to turn out great. I feel. Um, I think we should just go into countries and just colonize them and build. You know, McDonald's is everywhere. I mean, I'll solve a lot of issues. To be fair, but, yeah. I think we should basically just take over some countries, install a good moral framework, fifty years, and then there'll be a minority resistance group, and then we just influence them massively. Yeah, they have a better off life. It's a hard learning curve, and that'll be good. So I feel like it's like North Korea, you know, I mean, our sanctions working, <laughs> uh, same with uh, other countries too, are our sanctions mm. going to uh, destroy them or is it going to make them more radical in their direction because we're making them starve and you know, making them extremely poor? You know, so, I, I think if we... So you'd rather invade uh, North Korea? That would be a better... Well, uh... not exactly North Korea. Well, I have a way, you know, we can do the money bomb with North Korea. We, we send over, uh, you know... We send over, say, a few planes over North Korea at night, drop loads of money, cause hyperinflation, cause them to have to adopt the US dollar, open up to international trade, and so on. But, you know, I won't go there. Uh, that's probably a, another plan in the CIA banks that I'm not authorized to look at. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that get sounds like promotion. spy talk. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think they'll take kindly to Keynes either. Uh, but it should be good. He but I honestly think. You know, a big stick. That's a good diplomatic policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe I the mean, U.S. Be uh, nice went... until it's time not to be nice. I think the U.S. may have so, gone a little bit away from there. For example, with the Iraq War, I think some of the neocon people, even if you say, well, what, well uh, they may have wanted things to be, uh, you know, one way, you know, they or they may have been corrupt bastards, however you look at it. But there were reports going around, like there are genuine feelings that, uh, uh, for example, Condoleezza Rice, she wrote about how she believed that the Iraqi people will now embrace democracy and all that. And you ended up seeing what exactly ended up going down there. So it's not that the people there in Iraq in the future, maybe with enough education, with enough emphasis on developing a different culture there, not to say that something like that wouldn't happen, but I think there are steps 
and some people may not be, you know, as like an entire population, they may not be ready. They end up voting yeah. in some kind of a tyrannical uh, warlord that's favorable to their tribe as opposed to the tribe that was, uh, you know, there earlier. And that's been the history, I think, of a lot of these conflicts, unfortunately, uh, where America's gotten in there and it did not act like the British Empire. It did not act like, OK, we're coming in here. We're running things. If you don't like it, you can kiss our ass. Uh, so maybe... I don't know. It's weird because a lot of people are very anti-imperial. That's, but if yeah, mm -hmm. go on. Well, that's why I, I that's why I'm not really um, that's why I don't really think that force change really works. Right. I think you have to make incre incremental steps. And I think, again, subsidizing people, um, subsidizing industries, um, rewarding uh, good behavior from certain countries. I think that's a great way to implement in incremental changes over time, forcing a huge cultural change. Uh, is never going to work. It, people are, it's mm -hmm. just like too much of a shock for people. People are very ingrained in their, in their stuff, you know, but like when it comes to in like specific, specific, um, practices within cultures, like, oh, uh, we'll, you know, we'll start, um, you know, giving more aid to, to this one area. If they stop doing this one thing that we find, you know, really, really bad for people. Right. I can counter this though, because oh, if, no. you, if you look at Japan and South Korea, yeah, I can counter Okay, Miles, you counter it, and I'll counter it afterwards. Counter it. Go on. Yeah, let's say let's say that let's say there's a group that makes up ten percent of a population, and they're you know they're basically like ISIS two point They're terrible. Then you've got all the nice women and children who are totally innocent on this, and they're barely scraping by. Boom, U.S. sanction because we don't reward this behavior. We're like you know a narcissistic uh, leader of the world, and then boom, they most of them just starve. But we have to restrict, oh. uh, you know, we have to restrict them, we have to yes. punish them. And then, boom, they become more radicalized. And then the other group go, oh, wow, well, you know, that, well, you know, the extremists, they're right, they're destroying our livelihoods. We mm -hmm. might as well become radicalized and get even worse. I mean, you know, create a terrorist yeah. attack. That's usually what happens anyway. You know, if you, That's, if you yeah. really force someone into a corner, they kind of, you know, buy back. Yeah, sure. I, I I see that. And that's why why you don't pull out completely out of a country, right? When you when you want to punish an industry for for having bad practices, you punish that industry where people are doing those bad practices. And you try to find people within that same country who are um, who are not doing these bad practices. Right. Um, just like um, if you find like you an should area like for what? You should apply for the CIA. That's exactly what they do. They fund militias that overthrow governments and certain institutions they see as right. Actually, wait, what if we turn it the opposite way around and let's say North Korea somehow becomes, you know, the most powerful nation in the world and they deem their what they do is correct. So would you be okay with them exporting your ideas on you and then taking away your internet access and free running water well, and so on in infrastructure be taking, because right. you don't agree with that stuff? So, so what I'm talking about is like, for example, the brick industry in India, right? Like if we look at the brick industry within India, you can take, you can take away funding. You can take away um, people buying from that brick industry if they're using slave labor and you can buy from a different brick uh, um, creator or supplier within India that doesn't use that slave labor. It's similar to that. You're not destroying the entirety of a country's economy. You're just in you're taking the investment from one area and you're putting it in another mm. well these are monetary incentives and that hasn't worked out for but that hasn't worked out for say north korea and everything like that when yeah, yeah north how's that korea, work when i don't, a, when I don't one, really know wait 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 wait, wait, yeah. wait sorry wait wait wait, wait. How, how how would you resolve it for a dictatorship because they control every aspect of the country so you can't really invest in different groups that are slightly different because you would be investing in the government anyway I mean, I, how do you invest in Laos, North I, Korea, no. Iraq, Libya? Right. Iran, I think you I think you can invest countries. I think you can invest when they when they make strides in, in certain aspects and incremental strides, right? Like again, we're not forcing an overnight change. But um as far as dictators go, I don't know, it's more complicated with that, right? Um uh if if a dictator decides that they just don't want to um, comply in any sort of way, then they're just not going to, right? Um, uh, so it's more complicated then. But at least with, um, uh, at least within like working with other democratic nations or semi-democratic nations, you can at least um, like 
you know, pull out from certain areas and put more into others. So mm. there was yeah. an example I wanted to bring mm. of uh, Japan and South Korea. So after World War II, the United States not only invested money in these areas, but they also inv invested a lot of manpower where people had to go there. They had to teach a lot of things uh, to these uh, places, not to say that they didn't know how to handle things without them. But I think that that initial devotion of time and resources towards that place it made these countries very different. And uh, I think that there is something to the idea that there was a Japan pre-World War II and during World War II, and then there was a different Japan afterwards. I mean, sure, you could say, like, the bombs had something to do with it and all the violence, uh, you know, but I still think that there was this aspect of the U.S. Army being physically present there for a long time and running things to a certain extent that I think did have a positive uh, outcome as far as how uh, these countries are today. So the reason that I mentioned that is, sure, like the investments you're talking about, Stardust, I think that's important. But I'm not sure if these investments are playing as much of a role on like the root cause, which I think goes back to how the families uh, raise their kids, as well as how are the kids, uh, you know, what are they what, is, what environment are they exposed to in school? What environment are they exposed to in their social groups? That also takes time, but I think that there should be a very serious effort if you're going to do it at all uh, to you know, target those particular areas if you want there to be a change. And I think that goes beyond just a uh, question of money. Sure. Um, I would ask then like, how much of a change from the, um, from the culture, from the home culture, was it that they were imposing through that force, right? Like it, if it's a drastic change, it obviously is something that's not gonna work. But if, they're, if there's a way that they're meeting them middle way, right? Or, or, or helping them incrementally change, then I can see that working, sure. Well, pre, uh, uh, during World War II, uh, Japan was, slow. yeah, go on. I think mean, that's a slippery slope. I think they would recognize that, you know, they're trying to make incre incremental changes. And if it's something they very much believe in, like religion, they're not going to budge one bit. And I don't blame them. If someone told me, well, Miles, uh, you can go to church, but only, uh, you know, you can't take communion or let's say communion's limited or some very small change. I'm going to flip out and I'm going to. Yeah, you can't. Uh, I wouldn't say Ted Pray, but you, know. at once. Mm. you have to, you have to yeah, slowly that, turn well, the heat up. No, well, Lord Miles yeah, says that then, they'll recognize it. I think they still go revolt. Yeah, they still go I mean, revolt. Some, I mean, some yeah. people, some it people will recognize it. Some people but will recognize it. Was like it but, years. Hmm. You're trying to indoctrinate but that's people. That's why you do. That's why you do these things slowly, right? And it's not overnight, and it's not like it's an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, in twenty years, it didn't happen in Afghanistan. Then just as bad as ever. Um, 20, 30 years of invasion. We're thinking, uh, if we want to change the entire society, hundreds of years. And then even then, you know, the things we're trying to influence on them won't be present in a hundred years anyway. You know, we're always going to be far behind. Um, well, what about you know, Britain? It, what about Britain and India then? If you use that as an example of, we saw that there were improvements as far as the water, I mean, the railways. We can even like look. That. We can even look um, even more recently. Again, like the brick industry, right? Like, um, like uh, India has been making strides in. Um, in labor right as far as these people who are kind of in the this contracted labor where they're quite literally slaves without realizing it they are making strides in that there's still a lot of it going on but um but they have been working um on it and 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 i think economic incentives do work in that way and um and if it's like incremental changes again i do think it works it's not something that's going to be easy at any point right um but it, it, it's still it's it, like it's still better to do incremental change than like trying to force a change a huge change overnight force an, an entire societal change so mm. but i'm not as so in, with, yeah, in 1990 on. india had so in 1990 india had 6.1 million slaves today it has 7.9 million it's getting worse uh, so if that's that's in that's between 1990. But if you look at like the past, I believe like 10 years, I'd have to look at the stats again. But if you look at like the past like 10 to 20 years, I do believe that it's gotten better. Um, as far as like percentages uh, it's go, still as a well. million days. Yeah, but we also have to take into consideration mm. like what is per capita, right? Mm. Because the uh, None population of these just numbers is exponentially. In yeah, the, the population is exponentially growing in India. The percentage has still gone down significantly. 
I'm not as familiar with what happened it's during still, the uh, I, during the during the British Raj. So what I'm curious about is when there was the British Raj, how did they handle the question of slavery? Did, what were the steps that they took, and were those steps successful, or weren't they? Bonded laborers. That's what it is. Sorry. Because that's really where I think uh, our question is here. Do we do we go in favor of having these more? Uh, you know, uh, more influential empires coming into countries and changing things pretty drastically. And I don't know if the answer is yes. Yeah. I know, Stardust, you're not exactly for that, but this is what I'm curious about the British Empire. Did the British Empire, to any of your guys' knowledge, did it do anything to reduce this slavery that uh, you were just talking about? I honestly, I, I can't speak too much into that. I don't know a whole lot of history in that area. Um, uh, yeah, I can just only talk really in, in recent stats mm. and stuff like that. Well, so there was the uh, provision in the Indian Penal Code of 1861, which abolished slavery in British India by making the enslavement of human beings a criminal offense. So let's pretend, for example, because I don't have the statistics and now I am going to look all this up, but let's pretend that this was something that the British officers who were stationed in India were very drastically enforcing. And mm -hmm. my question is, after the British left, was there as much of the same kind of uh, enforcement? Again, if, if there even was mm -hmm. that level of enforcement, you know. I, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. When I'm talking about slavery within India, I'm talking about bonded labor. Or, or debt bondage um and so so uh so while like and there are even laws against bonded labor right um or debt bondage in india but um a lot of the people who are in that type of bondage are are unaware that it's you know against the law um they don't even realize that they're being exploited so um so it, it's taken a while for them to mm. make progress in it but they have made progress in recent years um i'm just trying to look up where i last saw the uh the stats on it but um yeah uh as far as like po pre and post-colonial india i couldn't really speak on that to be honest mm. with you uh so well yeah. then we can move up we can move on from this particular uh, subject i would do want to get to immigration unless lord miles unless there is anything you want to add as far as the british empire in india because now i'm fascinated now i want to learn more about how exactly it went down all that I already told you before was that they weren't making as much money there. So for them, it was more of, you know, how can we... And again, I'm not saying everybody, but for you know, quite a bit of them, it was more about how do we make this a better place for the people to live in there. And I think it did come from this Christian kind of uh, idea of wanting to improve the people's lives. But anyway, is there anything else you know about the British Empire concerning, you know, whether they effectively were able to combat a lot of these more uh, backwards things that were going on, like the burning of the widows, that one I know for sure, but also things like uh, slavery, and uh, whether it remained that way after the British went, or not. Well, they did introduce a lot more charitable aspects to India and did a lot of good things for them. And of course, there were some bad people who exploited them and so on, you know, it was a very mixed bag, but, you know, history doesn't remember all the good as well. But I think we should get on to immigration. I think I would yes. very much enjoy that. All right. So on to immigration, everybody. And listen, for all the people who are watching here, subscribe, subscribe, and subscribe right now to break the rules. We got to grow this thing. And I really appreciate Lord Miles, Mass Bastard, mm -hmm. and Stardust, the lovely Stardust, for being here. You guys are amazing. I love your background, by the way. I can't say enough good things about it, Stardust. The pink oh, and you. the orange and the yellow it really works well. And it works well with the tiger theme that you have, you and the tiger. And who is that? Oh, uh, who's that swan? Is that John Swan? Or are you holding john swan and that uh no. profile thanks for no. strangling john swan it's just a joke uh because i i um i sometimes on twitter if somebody's like acting crazy on twitter i'll just start replying with honks to them and mm. that's apparently uh apparently uh you know yeah that yeah. that became an issue with keffels so yeah Ah, oh, Keffels, what are we going to do with you? Anyway, yeah. on to the immigration. Uh, so I was talking before with Lord Miles where my idea of uh, how we can solve this left-right divide that's going... I don't even know what the hell to call it. The idea, my idea is that immigration should be based on do you want the people to immigrate uh, who would be 
closer to how you prefer to live as far as how you raise your kids, what kind of values you instill in your kids, whether you would want your kids to hang around with their kids. So basically, you know, being whatever we would consider to be regardless of wherever you're from, being of a certain level of uh, civilized. Again, we have to define it like what does it mean to be civilized and so on and so forth. But again, it's like I can imagine me hanging out with Mass Bastard, Stardust, Lord Miles, and we could all get along uh, handsomely. So that's kind of what I mean, like having that level of understanding that uh, they come from generally like the same kind of mindset. They could have different styles of food they could have you know whatever but as long as like these particular things are taken care of that i see as being something that could be focused more on when it comes to the kind of people that would want to emigrate to whichever country like as long as they can vibe with the standards that we want to uphold then that's fine and again i'm not i'm purposefully right now not getting to the nitty-gritty of well how do you define that standard or this standard i'm just yeah, how do you a, keep people from lying I'm like just, I could say anything. Yes, I know, I know. I'm painting I a broad... I Pepsi and Coca-Cola. I own I, both companies. Yes, I'm painting a very broad picture here. And it's <laughs> something for us to go into details with later on. But, Miles, you have a different uh, picture, so go on. Yeah, I still think your picture is kind of based, to be fair, better than most um, with what people say. And I've got to respect it. I didn't mention that earlier, but good right. stuff still I, I feel like we shouldn't be talking more about immigration i would just stop it mostly entirely um i uh, cut down 90 percent let's say and i was not deporting people who actually don't agree with the country's values that are, you know acting like uh you know a barrier to unity in the country um you know the good old uh american type of people i feel like nowadays there's people that just want to break apart the nation that do pose a threat to the actual sovereignty of, say, the US and the UK and so on. And, you know, if they came here in the last 20 years or something, I don't see why they should stick around, truthfully. I mean, some people come here, um, like uh, like Stardust said, and they get universal health care, and I, my taxes go towards it. And then they moan and cry about the, ma the nation not being Muslim, let's say, or not being X, Y, Z, when it's clearly not X, Y, Z type of nation. It's our nation and you have to adapt to it. We don't adapt to you because you're coming here as a privilege to enjoy what we have because we're letting you in so kindly. So I think these people shouldn't stick around. All right, Stardust, uh, go for it. Yeah, um, I think that I think that from what I from everything that I've read, um, immigration seems to benefit us uh, uh, economically. Um, it seems to benefit us in um, uh, multiple ways. And I think as long as the people who come here are willing to um, uh, like be part of the country and be part of um, America, then uh, I'm fine with it. But I can't really speak to, I guess, the UK and, and the unique problems that they face there. Um, yeah. C can you please define when you say being a part of, how do you define that? Um, like um, assimilating and being a, a working member of society, contributing to the economy, things like that. Mm. At what levels would you say contributing to the economy? So, for example, one of the things that I was speaking to Lord Miles about was how if we have like if we have like a pyramid of jobs where we have like in the base certain jobs that could be done by people who are already, you know, multitudes of people in the U.S. could do this, you know, very, very easy jobs. And then you have, you know, the smaller parts of the pyramid, more specialization, more specialization and so on. Uh, just in terms of even just like practical you know, practical nature, being able to take care of enough people, having a kind of system, like you mentioned, with uh, the health care, where we can ensure that enough people are being uh, able to be taken care of. Would you have any kind of limit when it comes to the kind of jobs that can already be done by multitudes of people who are already here? Uh, generally, like, so ge generally, uh, we have immigration to kind of keep up with like the labor gaps that we have right um and generally like the the pot you know people are not keeping up with like um with like um having children right things like that uh so um so immigration is uh 
good for us in that sense that we need to keep up the um, amount of the population that is younger, that is working, that so that they can also take care of the older population. Um, and so I think as long as somebody is working a job, um, I think that they're contributing to the society. I don't think it really matters if they are um, a skilled a skilled person or not, right? Because the same argument that you make for somebody who's unskilled coming in, you can make for somebody who is skilled coming in. So you could just say like, oh, well, you know, there are plenty of people who are unskilled who need that job. There are plenty of people who are skilled who also need those jobs, right? But there, the fact is, is that there are still labor gaps. And so uh, we need to be able to like fill those gaps. Miles. Uh, very much disagree. I think that's very naive. I think that's what most uh, libertarians feel like when they turn 18, you know? Um, they, they just like, oh, everyone comes together. The GDP matters, not everyone's quality of life, happiness, community, group identity. No, it's all about the GDP, bro. Uh, no. Um, how about we just have more children? How about we repeal the birth uh, pill for women? In, uh, because it's damaging for society on every single metric, apart from people that just want to sleep around because you know they're whores. Same with men too. I disagree with both men and women sleeping around. Uh, they should just you know, not do that. Have some self-control. Have loads of children. Um, support those children. Feel happy in a society that is, you know, majority them. Uh, you know, because if you go into certain communities and you can't even recognize your own country. Um, the immigration doesn't matter. I don't care what the numbers say on the screen. I would rather live in a slightly poorer nation um, that has everyone that's very similar in groups, ideals, understandings, um, and everything, rather than one that worries about GDP in the short term. Why do you think America is so fractured? Because too many ideas, too many conflicting beliefs are coming into one system. Now everyone feels alienated regresses into their own community, becomes radicalized because they're you know, being threatened in every single way, like every single group. And the whole mixing pot idea of America was invented by a Jewish man in 1911 during a newspaper publication where the general sentiment was never actually like that. That newspaper publication was ripped apart and laughed at. America was never a melting pot to some degree. It was laughed at and no one felt the same sentiment. And only now that's being pushed for mass immigration, where mass immigration does not help most of the time in the long run. It collapses nations, groups, identities. Most people feel depressed and sad. And that's why people feel terrible now. That's why suicides are extremely high. And that's why you so you're main... Oh, wait, wait, before you start, start us, sorry, before you reply, uh -huh. being a fellow member of the tribe myself, I got to say something real quick about that. I know that there is a tendency on the Internet today to, uh, you know, always uh, call out the uh, J's on certain things like that. What I would say, being a J myself and knowing many J's who are absolutely not thrilled with what's been going on as far as uh, immigration into both uh, European places and the United States, where they would actually prefer to live in a place where people share the same kind of values that they originally came here and became citizens of the U.S. in order to uphold. That's why I want to make the distinction that when we're speaking of people who come from you know, the pale, uh, the pale of settlement, settle into the United States, a lot of them who end up in cities, they are going to be very effective at adopting the milieu of the time. And in the 1930s, for example, a lot of that was Stalinism. The uh, intellectuals used to consider socialists who were not Stalinists to be, as they called it, social fascists. Same thing in the turn of the century or in the, uh, sorry, in the early 20th century, like in the 1920s when you had anarchists, you had all kinds of people. People who are going to come from a Jewish extraction who are going to be in the intellectual urban elite, they're going to get to the top of that and they're going to be really good at what they do. And unfortunately, they're going to be leftists. That does not mean that you're going to have all the people who come from those areas, who come from that, uh, those peoples being leftists. I am not a leftist, and there are many people I know of the same ilk who are not leftists at all and don't care for it one bit. That's why I just want to say that when we're talking about these things, I don't personally like the, you know, uh, putting in together of things that, uh, you know, I think it's kind of like an old hat already. But anyway, that's just my spiel. I wanted to say that. Stardust, go for it. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting. Okay. But anyways, um, so your main 
it, Miles, okay. your your main uh, uh, problem with this is that you think that immigrants don't assimilate, basically, and that because they don't assimilate, it's like bad for they the. Don't. Okay, so there is a ton of research. Oh, so much. Thank that, you, Thank you. Okay, there's a ton of research that shows that immigrants are assimilating as well or better than previous immigrant immigrant groups, even Mexicans um, uh, within America, at least. Um, the National Aca Academy of Science um, in September 2015, uh, they uh, they titled the book, uh, or they sorry, that they they published a book that says assimilation is never perfect. And always takes time, but it's going very well. July 2015, uh, there was a book um, that analyzed immigrants and second generation integration on 27 measurable indicators across the OECD and EU countries. And the report finds more problems with immigrant assimilation in Europe, especially for those from outside of the EU. But the findings for the United States are quite positive. So that seems like it's more of like a failing of the EU that people aren't assimilating. Maybe the EU needs to do something there. Um, uh, and then through inter intermarriage in time, uh, more educated um, descendants of Hispanic immigrants don't really identify as Hispanic. Um, uh, they end up identifying as white over time. Uh, so yeah, people do assimilate really well in America. Just the EU is not as good at it as us. Mm. Well, I wouldn't say that's true. I mean, you're looking at studies that don't actually. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because does. I can pull I'll up data that exactly says the other way. No, I can. I can Google. I can Google search things. But at the same time, you you say, "Oh, I'm going to quantify this," like you're some sort of scientist. But you know, like with my degree in physics, I've looked at quite a lot of data analysis myself. And one basic thing I found out is social scientists such as this have a huge degree in accuracy. And it's very, very, it's almost impossible to actually quantify it properly because it believes on metrics that are derived from things that are basically just assumed, which you can't do. That's why I believe 80% of social studies have non replicable uh, have pieces of data that are not replicable. I can't say the word now. I need more water. But um, you can't replicate the data. And at the same time, you can throw study after study, but most people are becoming more and more anti-immigration because the reason they don't want it. At the same time, they don't want more people coming to the country. And, you know, people have the same complaints over and over again, where they don't want people that disagree with their ideals, disagree with their group identity, and go against their social interests. That's why most people are against immigration, against Mexicans, and so on in mass numbers numbers legally or illegally and so on and that's you disagreed with me too you also said um you know integration isn't perfect but it's going well well going well isn't good enough i want 100 percent integration because if you just take a small bit of differing bits when it comes to integration if if the ideals change just bit by bit after 20 30 50 years you have a whole different country of ideals that aren't on the line that they should be where the country when it remains the same people you know it's just going to keep changing the country over and over again they don't integrate properly first generation immigrants never integrate properly and it becomes a huge no, it's issue. not same first generation EU, it's second and third every other country. but okay so, so i work. just because just people. because the uk just because the uk and the eu are bad at helping people integrate into society into their society doesn't mean that america should be following what they're doing america's clearly better at it i'm sorry that you guys suck at it but america all by all studies shows that we're very good at, at helping people assimilate into our society society um and uh and this idea that our 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 society is changing because of immigrants is just not true it's just not true people well, assimilate people come actually people come over from uh these immigrants come in and oftentimes they share a lot of the same ideals because a lot of them are deeply devoutly catholic or deeply devoutly christian a lot and of them WWF have these, fans they have a lot of similarities with us hmm. Well, they have some similarities, but it doesn't mean they're the same. They may be Catholic, but well, they believe in certain say... ideals. The same country, America is not the same country. It was in the 60s. You'd have the same people, same yeah, ideals, same now. economy, same We are the best beliefs. country. No, it's gone we worse. Better no, than... it's gone no worse. we're better than we were in the 60s. You think that? Are you because kidding people me? are more By depressed, people measure. are more sad, more mass shootings, no, more they're suicides. Not. More Women were fucking killing people themselves at home in the 60s. Women were on barbiturates. Women were seen as psychiatrists because they were so depressed at home. Why are you own country with immigrants that most 
so sorry. I'm so sorry that the UK sucks at integrating people, that you guys put people in ghettos, but America's just better at it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. All right, I got I gotta, I gotta us. I think the UK and Europe in general. I, I got to throw I got to throw some, something in here, okay? And I don't know if this is the fault of the school system all the fall or the fault of culture. I completely personally reject any uh, talk about, you know, race or DNA or something like that because I think that people are very flexible. Look at the North Koreans and South Koreans. People can uh, change. It just depends on factors and time and so on and so forth. But if on we're a full talking moon, about I change into a werewolf, exactly, or Goku changes into the uh, Ozaru monkey. But anyway, if we're talking about uh, another Dragon Ball reference, if we're talking about uh, California, let's say, from what I understand, Stardust, you could correct me if I'm wrong. It's a very diverse place as far as there being a lot of people from uh, Central America and South America who are uh, li- and from Mexico, obviously, who are living in uh, California. California has culturally, you could say, changed. Its education system has a lot of money that is pumped into it, but the results are not really there, from what I understand. Again, I could California be wrong. California funds more uh, through taxes than uh, all of the other states. Yes, exactly. So we have... We fund, uh, uh, so I'm not in California, but California, as far as I can tell, they can do whatever they want because they fund more to the federal government than any other state. And the other, there are tons of states that are being floated by California. So California can do whatever the hell they want. As far as it goes for me, California seems to be doing just fine, especially since they are, they are um, floating so many different states in the United States, especially um, uh, even with their immigrant population, they are, they are doing so great economically. They are, huh. they haven't changed their, they haven't changed their, their, their values. There's, you know, there's still uh, American values. Sure. There are more <laughs> Latin Americans there. There are more Spanish speakers there. That doesn't mean that their values have changed at all. They come to America and everybody's American and everybody believes in American values. And but let's, but let's stay freedom. focused here. But let's stay focused specifically on what are the education results. So tests are given, the kids do the test, the tests come back. What are the education results right now of California? That, I think, is the key. Because, look, a country, um, a state can subsist on, like, the high-end technological uh, industries there. But still, if we're talking about, like, the most vulnerable class, like the middle class, like, people who need there to be a higher standard to reach towards, and I believe everybody is capable of reaching towards that standard, if that is not being done right now, then I think there may be a certain question of what are the I kind of there cultures... there are other states to worry about. There are other states to worry about. West Virginia is, like, top on, on being least educated. Like, least educated Why? states are West Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana. So I'm not too worried about California. But that's... California... Well, California... Okay. California you know, is doing I would pretty good. California. Sorry, right. California's just sinking the Yeah, ocean. because you're jealous. Hellful. Because you're jealous that California is so fucking based and that UK can't keep up, keep up with one state in America. So, California's sorry. California's based. You I feel like West Virginia is way more All of the movies you watch are from oh, no. California. West Virginia cry will more, tell cry California. Cry more, exactly. more. No, there's a no, there's a there's a problem that, that that there's a problem that's going on here. I'm so, the, okay, there's a problem that's going on here. So. I understand you're talking about West Virginia sucking in terms of education. I don't want to go into what about is a mode right now. I want to just stick right now to the education levels in California California and look at. California has some of the highest um, uh, uh, like outcomes as far as education goes. Okay, so specifically, if we're talking about like the graduation rate is eighty three eighty three percent. uh, and and a huge put like a third of their population gets a bachelor's degree or higher. So I think they're doing really well. Interesting. That then I have to go the college. No. Then I have to go back and look at the uh, statistics uh, yeah. for later because that is very different from what I saw earlier on. So again, no, this is a very important question because I can be very. Some of the dumbest jabronis I know are college educated people. They don't well, that's a, that's a whole that's a whole other thing. That's a I whole understand. different. That's a whole yes. different. Thing. Okay, let, let me see. Here. California. They don't deserve to go to college education. I okay. don't know, dude. All I'm right, sure here, going to a war into a war. Oh, okay, here we go. Here, here we go. This is this is an important one. So it says over here, worldpopulationreview.com. California's 23.1 percent of adults lacking basic prose literacy literacy skills may California have the lowest literacy rate of 76.9 percent. So the school system may have something to do with that. 
And I think that culture also has something to do with it as far as when you have people, let's say the Jews, for example, you have Jewish people who came from the Pale of Settlement, didn't speak, speak a lick of English, yet they understood that it was very important, regardless of whether they were being discriminated against, to work very, very hard, work very, very smart. And if the hospital didn't want to admit Jewish doctors, you know what they did? They started their own hospital. So uh, this is something that I think every person is capable of as far as, uh, you know, if we're talking about people from Mexico or wherever, but I don't see that being the focus. Instead, I see a lot of virtue signaling from people in California saying, oh, we love our immigrants so much, yet I don't really see that much of a focus on improving something like this literacy sure. rate. So they probably, they're probably working on it. I think, um, I think probably a lot of it that, um, that has to do with it is if you have a lot of immigrants coming in, probably they're not coming in um, like super educated, right? Um, uh, at yeah, least if, if it's coming from, if it's coming from, if they're coming from like the, from across the border, right? Um, so, so yeah, they have to make improvements in that, in that case, certainly. But, um, but they still by far, despite that um, education issue, they still by far are, are doing the best economically. Mm. All right, one more thing. Results. Wait, well, one more thing. Results from the 2019 National Assessment of Educational Progress show that only 32% of fourth graders are reading proficiently. So these results put California below the national average and behind 25 other states. So again, you cannot attribute this to just the uh, first generation migrants who fled from wherever to come here. This is students who are part of the California mm -hmm. school system. To me, this shows a complete lack of focus on having this very high standard that everybody should abide by. In, in New York, by the way, where I'm from, what that stupid fuck de Blasio decided to do, and I don't think it was passed, but what he wanted to do was he wanted to lower the, the uh, literacy standards and lower the uh, hard testing because the uh, kids who were black and Latino were not doing so hot. So he wanted to ruin things for the Asian kids and for the white kids just because because uh, they they didn't you know it, it wasn't it wasn't equity he wanted equity my approach would be make it even harder and make sure that you're paying special attention to these kids in their communities to get them to that same level which I believe is 100 percent possible yet they don't want to focus on raising the bar and that's what I think I really think, sucks I think that you know what I think we can agree on raising the bar but I think that um, like looking at this one stat, when you've got the entirety of California that is like literally keeping other states afloat, I think that's not really like indicative of a problem with immigration, right? Um, uh, maybe because California is one of the most but that's like but that's states. like saying Saudi but, Aramco is keeping Saudi Arabia afloat when you have a bunch of really really dumb people there that are rich off of oil. They're not the ones keeping it afloat. It's the oil and it's the industry. So that's a very different thing. No, I, I mean, mention, I think there are, there I are people mention a few who are, things about California. The, the, they, are paying, they are paying taxes, and those taxes fund a lot of other states. Um, yeah, I the productive think, people are, but we need to get more people on a higher level. Okay, sure. Yeah, let's get you more people the on a higher level. people are, too. <laughs> yeah, let's no, well, the how about homeless uh, situation in California. What's going on with that? How yeah, come those people in homelessness. Like Homelessness is highest in the U.S. and California. Most antidepressants used in California. Mm -hmm. um, California is also the most unhappy state. Highest cost of living, highest housing prices, which you want to reduce, by the way. But you know, California is so great. Um, oh yeah, um, basically California is the hellhole of America. Biggest. Doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. If I'm a billionaire, right. but I'm living a miserable lifestyle because of the ethics and the soullessness of the country, I'd rather be poor. And I've chosen that time and time again. That's why I dropped out of investment banking. You see, I would rather live in, say, Texas, which is happier. And that's why everyone's moving out of California. That's why there's a huge exodus of the California population. And I don't care about GDP um, most of the time. It doesn't matter about money. And that's the one thing that ruins nations. This is basically the fall of Rome just slowly happening in time. And that's why most people dislike California. It's a hellhole. And everyone in the U.S. pretty much agrees with me. It's the most hated state in the country. But just because it has a few extra numbers, why don't we just... I don't know. Um, instead of basically paying the most money to federal government, why don't we just reduce the government? We should go a little bit California, more libertarian on that. Okay. So California has some of the best colleges in the United States. They have Stanford, they have Berkeley, they have UCLA, they have UCSD. So a lot of the issues that you're talking about, which, okay. It, How are their football finish. teams? 
if you if you let me finish if you, a lot of the issues with the education in california is a budgetary issue right so yeah <laughs> maybe they can they can put more oh. they can put more money into the they can put more money into the public school system sure but as far as california itself having the best some of the best uh college institutions in the in the united states let alone the world right um i think that uh I think that you're just completely off base here. I mean, again, it's the I'm, I'm fifth gone. largest, the fifth largest economy in the world surpasses the UK. I'm sorry. It surpasses the UK. Yeah, well, but where's the, the entire place where the one mm. producing? Mm. Coke Harder, dude. Coke Harder. There, 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 there is a nice. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to move to California out of All spite. Right. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. You should do I it. I would love to see you do that. The first come to Afghanistan. Enjoy the weather. Yeah, no, the weather's nice. I won't no. go to Afghanistan because I'm a woman, and I'm a brown woman, and I'll probably get uh, fucking killed over there. So, no, I'm not going to go over to Afghanistan. There is a Sounds nice... A uh, I'm a white guy going to Afghanistan. I'm just okay, sure, but All you're right, still a man. That's significantly better status than I a woman. Like the so. second I step off the plane, the, there'll be five guys who guy. walk I'm up a to try to fight me. <laughs> There is, a, there is a nice analogy, which I read in a book uh, about uh, Sweden. So Sweden used to have, when it had less taxation and less social programs, it used to be, I think, like the number one economically speaking country within that uh, European sphere. And later on, uh, once it introduced a lot of these welfare programs, it started going lower and lower and lower and lower. The reason why I'm talking about Sweden, and I think its economy was at its peak at around like the 50s or 40s, something like that. I think 50s. Anyway, the reason why I'm talking about it is I like the analogy that book offered where it compared it to having a rich uh, son or daughter of, uh, you know, like some uh, wealthy magnate and the magnate passes away and they leave all this bunch of money to this uh, rich offspring who then spends it nilly willy and you could say that before when the magnate was alive you know there was a lot of a lot of money a lot of resources and there was a lot of boastfulness going on throwing throwing on these tea parties and whatever talking about how oh we have so much money then Take a couple of years after the magnate dies and you have this uh, rich asshole who's spending that money everywhere and he says the same thing. Look how much money I have. Look how rich I have. Uh, I, look how rich I am. But the question that that book asks is relative to what happened uh, before, you're not that rich. You're still rich, like you look very rich, but you're spending this money in a very bad way that eventually you're going to you're going on the losing trajectory. That was the example they brought in relation to Sweden, which was once economically way above and now it's right. going down. I thought we weren't so I'm not able to bring up other states in the United States, but you're bringing up an entirely different country. Yes, but the reason why I'm bringing okay. it up is yes, just yes, Yes, it's my show, but no. The reason why I'm bringing it up is yeah. just to is just to give an example breaking of the rules. breaking the rules. Break the rules. TV. Subscribe right now. <laughs> is just to show what happens when you're looking at the success of a country, but not looking at certain things that are in play right now, which may spell the end of that success in years to come. That is a very important thing to look at. And I would also bring up a, um, I believe an Arabian uh, king said this. I don't remember his name. I can look it up. And I think he Jeff. talked, Jeff, exactly. King Jeff, uh, hail King Jeff, Everybody who talked Jeff. about how my, uh, my uh, grandfather rode a camel. Uh, my father rode, you know, like pick like some mid-sized car, you know, I rode a Lamborghini. My son is going to ride um, a Lexus and his son is going to ride a camel. I butchered the quote, but I think you kind of get what I'm talking about here. I don't think we should look at the economic situation and freeze it and pretend like there wasn't a before and there's not going to be an after. And it's very important. I don't think important. we should be looking at quotes, though, like these quotes about riding a camel. Like, <laughs> oh, my son's going to ride this, and then he's his son's going to ride a camel. Like, I don't think that's really Maybe even a reflection. A there's, either, a lesson, there's a lesson in it, though, I think. No, I agree with a camel guy. <laughs> I agree with camels. No, the, if it's just anti what you're saying, I agree with the camels. Like, oh, point. boy. No, Maybe I think the lesson... Maybe doesn't want to drive. No, the important lesson here, I think, is... We have to look at not the economic situation of any given country or state, but you have to look at what are the potential factors that may spell the downfall so that we can anticipate it instead of just being uh, 
ignorant about it. So in terms of California, I'm not seeing great things with the educational system. And I'm also seeing people like Elon Musk, for example, uh, Cal Exit, you know, going to Texas. A lot of companies are going to Texas right now. Texas is being very because prosperous. Because California taxes are very high and because they're tired of funding the rest of the states. And then what happens in a couple of years, maybe a decade? This is what I mean by looking, uh, looking forward. Maybe in time. taxes in other states need to, to, you know, go up a little bit. Maybe they need to push their game a little taxes bit. Taxes need well. to go down. Let's just let's just make it everyone pay most of their money to the governments because the government most has our best money. interests at heart. And if we just keep throwing, if we just keep throwing money at them, they'll just look after us and pay for everything, like universal health care. Yeah, well, work California has just, kind of imploded like, a lot like, of these states. Issues. I'm just saying, you know, so. There's been a no, lot no, of California's been nuts. exporting pretty much great Satan to every single country. Everyone hates California. Everyone in California is depressed, has issues, has uh, economic issues, the highest homelessness, highest antidepressants, highest rates of depression, highest uh, rates here's, of... Here's um, a really interesting stat for you. Here's a really, really interesting stat for you. It has the most... If Britain were a I'll US state, about the two it would be the second forest behind Alabama and before Mississippi. You keep Everyone talking about money, but you don't address any other issues. I'm just letting you oh, know. Bro, Britain got were a US of money, state. Bro. They would be the second poorest it's like, state. It's like if, if you got a person and said, oh, bro, he's a millionaire, but he's a crack addict, he's homeless, he pretty much can't relate to his neighbor. Yeah, um, he can't afford a house. Money. The he's a rich guy. Look at him. Wow. Home. England like, is literally the, the homeless crack addict. No, you, you, know, you know what a good example would be, though? It wouldn't be uh, England. It would be maybe even India. Or maybe it would mm -hmm. be certain third world uh, uh, countries in Central America. Because what you have there yeah, no, is you have a low middle class... Uh, I've spoken to people who are uh, from parts of Central and South America, and they say that their elite ends up going not into the businesses anymore, not into private corporations, but it ends up going into the civil service. Because what ended up happening was these uh, countries have a very, um, have a very uh, stratified class system where on top they have the civil servants people, the people who run the government, and on the bottom they have all the people who dwell in the favelas, the middle class is nowhere to be found. That is the trajectory that I'm seeing in California right now, at least from what I'm able to see. The middle class is being squeezed out, and instead, yes, we have this very rich Elysium-style elite, you know, who are in the tech, but you're also having a lot of poor people. So that's why we need to, to, to change these zoning restrictions and make housing more affordable. So more people in the middle oh, class no. can afford to live in California. It'll be awesome. Oof. I don't, I don't think, think they want to live in California. They do want to live in California because you know the work you know is there. The jobs are there. The jobs are there. The work is there. The labor is there. And they can they can make a, a good living there. With if they have the affordable people, housing to do it. With with the most homeless people? Do you know yeah, Do you know why housing is not affordable? Because they don't have affordable it's housing there. It's an investment. You know, no, a lot no, of the no. times you know they, why? they'll get it's these not, homeless it's people investment. and they'll put them on buses and send them to other cities. It's really funny. Why don't they just go to Texas or Florida? That's what I don't understand. Yeah, why would they? Because the work isn't Lucky there. Ben. The work isn't nearly, there isn't nearly as much work there as there is in California. So you're you saying there's work in California. There's tons of work in California. There's just not housing. So, wait, so as far as Texas and Florida goes... You're yeah. saying that there is far less work there in uh, in Texas and Florida than there is in uh, California. But at the same time, you are noticing that more people are traveling there, more people are starting to uh, yeah, see jobs rich there. and more are traveling and there. More, and, but more jobs are coming into these areas. So sure. when Elon more jobs... Elon is moving there because of taxes, and then he'll be bringing yeah. jobs to those places. Yeah, so, so that's what... great. That's great for those places. Yeah, and that means that even though you're saying more people want to go to California, if this trend keeps going, if these places are the new boom towns, wouldn't that they mean that... They want to see. Then we'll, have to, we'll see. have to see. But again, it's like if these places become nice and prosperous, it almost seems, and again, I'm in New York, so I've only seen this from a New Yorker perspective, not from a mm -hmm. Californian perspective. But from what I see, even when I look at the faces of these uh, so-called leaders in California, of these bureaucrats, these are losers. These are just like absolute run-of-the-mill losers who have no business being in the position that they're in. And when I see these well, losers, I see, I see decline. You know, the highest rates for lifetime literal homelessness were found in the UK. 7.7% uh, <laughs> versus right. the well, United States. We're, we're United States like was 6.2%. Exactly. We're too much like California. 
We're too much like California. You're not like exactly. California you're at all. You're, you're second. You're, I just, you're, I just wrote if a, you were I a state in the Vanessa. United States, you would be the second poorest yeah, state. Just, you are no nowhere near California. Wait, dude. wait, wait. Well, start, start. To be fair to Lord Miles, there uh, is this. Uh, got universal there, healthcare. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Oh, how's that? Yeah, you guys really manage it well, don't you? Handing out your details. You think America's going to manage ours? Yeah, we pretty much major in We can do it better. We've done assimilation better, and we can do that better too. I don't know. Well, Miles, Miles' points is that I might just, I might just be stirring shit here, but yeah. I just. I just print off a letter I'm writing to the Taliban commandos when I meet them in two months. You're going to be banned from the country. You'll never come oh, to Afghanistan. No. Oh, if I'm I so can't scared. Like, I was going to go there in the I'm first place. You think that I was going to go there in the first place? <laughs> oh, no. I can't go to Afghanistan no, now, guys. As a woman, no, as a proud Muslim you're woman. Yeah, I really want to go to Afghanistan. That's a place I want to go where I have to fully cover my face. great. It's better than California. I'd rather be in Afghanistan than California, inshallah. As a man who doesn't have to cover himself. Okay, Pizza you're an infidel yeah, to them, to just so myself. you know. I can't wear shorts. I do have you're to cover myself. You're an infidel to them, just well, so you no, know. No, 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 start, start. Actually, yeah. he's not okay, an infidel. He's not an infidel. He would have to pay. He would have to pay jizya. So, Lord, if Lord Miles were to live there, he would have to pay as a Christian the jizya tax. So Jews and Christians have to pay. Yeah. It gets what? It's less tax than California. <laughs> yeah, and what? California is better. California is better than it's Afghanistan, too. Hole. Excuse my language, but it's terrible. It's a shit. You know what? Afghanistan, rather... at least in California, I don't have to wear a full fucking cover over my face and over my entire yeah, body. Yeah, you just have people showing half their asses up and then just Well, I don't have shoulders. to do that. I'm and not required by law people. to show uh, half my ass. In California, there's still a lot of masks. Well, I don't know. It seems like uh, the cultural issues are a lot more. Mm. I don't like California. I would rather die before you don't like uh, acknowledging okay. right. nice California. I think the only thing I like about California is where the Californians have a sign. You wish you were California. You the wish you were California. You wish California. You the only place I can think of that has no wars. I am not jealous. I would not be jealous problems. of what you claim to be and what California is. You know, you're just jealous because you can't you're go just, to you're jealous because because you ran away from one, the UK and became the an UK atheist is, because you are godless. I could say anything one, now. The UK oh, is, is just... You don't even know um, me. I dislike the matter. UK. I dislike the UK. I, I always like, have. Wow. I'm agreeing with you on the UK. You've got nothing on me. Okay. Mm. All right. Oh, wait, so, wait, 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 wait. Everybody, settle down. You think you know what you're talking about? Everybody, settle down. Settle down. Hold on. I'm raining back the stream. I'm raining back the stream. All right. Wait, wait, okay, okay, okay. I'm raining back. Here we go. Hold on, hold on. I'm raining. I'm raining back the stream. I have not muted Mass Bastard because he uh, is on his best behavior right now. But I have muted the two of you temporarily. So first, right. I want to say, if you guys are enjoying this, please subscribe. Second of all, invest to Lord in love. Invest in Lev hashtag Invest in Lev to Lord Miles Point. He is not a fan of uh, England as it currently is, and so it goes back to my question about California. What are the things that have made England the kind of place that Lord Miles is not like? Can we extend that to what Lord Miles sees as going on in California? Lord Miles, you have the mic, and then I would love for Stardust to reply. Um, mass immigration, um, unchecked economic balances, uh, liberalism when we shouldn't influence in other countries. Uh, England's become too passive. I, I can go on a huge one-hour rant about it, but I won't. It comes down to a ton of things. I... Oh, where do I begin? Yeah, untapped immigration. Like uh, some immigration, I would say, okay, a little bit, but no, massive amount. I can go in some areas of Birmingham where I would walk for 30 minutes and I would see no one but Muslims. It's it's become very fragmented as a country. There's no group identity anymore. There's no pride in the country. So people just kind of dowsy around going, oh, I'm just an individual. But no, individualism doesn't work most of the time. Group identity really does work well. And of course, you can go extreme on both sides, but I pick it in between. And England's quite extreme on the individual side, which I just don't like. England could could have been a great nation, like it usually was with the empire. It ruled most of the world, including India. And they used to own the U.S. at some point, but then it just kind of failed and fell apart. It could be great, but uh, that's basically my point. It's following what California's done with, you know, with uh, trying to attempt universal health care. It's failed miserably. Everyone laughs at the NHS. Uh, taxes have gone up considerably, like in California. No one likes it here. Um, the rates of depression in and the U.S. and the U.K. have gone up massively with the trends I've described and the 
policies that have been adopted. Whilst all these poor countries are apparently just miserable, now they're very happy. You see the poorest countries are actually extremely happy. And that's why you've got Poland as well being the best of both worlds with mm. minimal immigration, but strong family values and a strong religion. I don't care if it's uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, to some degree, is you know they're happy at the end of the mm. day. Um, and that's what Poland is. I think and one, one quick thing about Poland, by the way, countries. it's one of my favorite countries, too. One quick thing about Poland. They recently brought in a lot of Ukrainian refugees in there. But you know what? The refugees, they're absolutely dandy there. You know, they they integrate well. So anyway. But anyway, Stardust, uh, I would love for you. No, exactly. Reply. I mean, there's been no. Okay, OK, fine. You can pick. There are some certain things, but I'm talking broad strokes here. Broad strokes there hasn't really been as much of a cultural clash. Culture-wise, there's not that much of a huge difference between the Ukrainians and the Polish. I can understand because they're neighbors, but at the same time, when you bring people across half the world that haven't heard of most of their values, which they haven't, and then try and integrate them, disaster. I think I could integrate very well into mm. China. I no, think but, I could do it. But not the, I mean, I, I but not the Polish and Ukrainians. China. Again, Polish and Ukrainians, those are very close cultures. I mean, hell, certain parts of Ukraine were parts of Poland and vice versa for a long time. Yeah. So that's just like, they oh, were, yeah. Yeah, they were forced together. Some, they were forced together. Okay. But then, I, feel, you know. I feel bad for insulting the UK now that, now that I realize that Lord Miles doesn't like the UK. I, I was a little <laughs> too hard on the UK. Look, America is a country... Um, much like the UK, very, very much founded on democracy, on freedom, maybe not the same levels. Oh. But in America, you can practice any religion that you want and nobody can stop you. You can you you as as long as you are a valuer of freedom and of democracy and individuality, you are an American and that is your group identity. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, uh, America has put together, has blended the, the best of all cultures and exported them to every country in the world. America exports music and culture and movies more than any other country in the entire world does because literally we are the best. We are the best mix of everything. Politics in America, when something happens, it shakes the entire world. Um, we have the best military in the world. We, per we are in 60 uh, uh, treaties with different countries to provide um uh to to provide um uh allyship to those countries and you know the uk isn't that bad the uk the um uk has a rich history of of um of, uh, you know well i mean they have imperialism but and imperialism I mean, Im immigration immigration it, it, look the uk it, it, look he spoke uninterrupted can i speak uninterrupted yes go on okay all right so the uk is is um it has its its struggles, but they've successfully removed racism as a problem. It's so welcoming that it has the highest rates of um, of KF. Uh, I think it's KF immigration anywhere in the Euro in Europe around eighteen percent. The NHS in the UK, while maybe is not up to par all the time, has saved millions of lives, and it's a country where. Basically, everyone, regardless of background, has access to healthcare, university education, and basic services. The UK is beautiful for that. And you know what? America maybe can learn something from that. But America is still a country of freedom where you can practice whatever religion you want. You can say whatever you want. Nobody can change what you say in your head or what you say out loud. Not yet. I feel like there's going to be some canings. I mean, kind of can. We export so much of our culture, man. People want to be us, okay? Yeah, they want to be uh, the face of America, but they don't want to be uh, Californian. They want to be the good aspects, but mm, you know, I, I I like America. You're I like the American jealous, people. You're I just don't you're wait, jealous wait, wait, wait. California, I, and you're jealous of the UK because you didn't want to the UK. Or you, you can say you're jealous of what has money. You think that there is a problem with immigrants nothing. integrating into the UK? You're yeah, the one who's is. not integrating. You're the one who's not integrating. It's not their problem. It's you. You're having an issue with yourself. No, it's their problem. Their guests in my place, they should integrate to my culture. In your place. Yeah, my country. I was born here. I Actually, grew up here. Everybody else is a problem except for you. Mm. Wait, I feel like well, no, we're... The... Wait, hold on, guys. I feel like we're playing uh, we're playing roles right now, which has a tendency of happening where you know we I'm go on fighter. streams. Uh, yeah, we we assume certain we assume, assume certain characters. I'm a fighter. 
instead what I what I want to do right now is I want to no. I want to pretend. Go to like, go to I want to go like. Yeah, I want to go like wanna full. Because you don't want to fucking die. Because you don't okay. want to fight. Because you just talk. Very because passive. I'm. Because I'm a woman, a, a brown Muslim woman. Excuses. Right? Excuses. Uh, I'm a Catholic. Who, who, yeah, Excuses. so what? You're still a man that is significantly more yeah. that is gives you significantly more agency in that part of the world than I would. Oh, ever I was wearing have. I was wearing a cross around my neck. I had do you no think issues. that you, do you think that around. being a man is in any way being a Muslim comparable to being a Muslim woman in Afghanistan? Yeah. I'm with I Stardust think you could on walk this one. around with a top hat and a cane, and nobody would mess with you. Well, especially they would with know the, what cane. the cane's for. Exactly. No, but I'm actually with Stardust on this one because you remember that whole controversy with Joe Rogan talking about the MMA fighter who was, you know, like the uh, man who uh, was in the women's uh, tournament, how he was kicking the uh, ass of all the women there. And Joe pointed out that there is like bone structure differences and all that kind of stuff that's going on there. Same, Not I true. think. Same, I think it is apply, applies to this question of going to such a place where Lord Miles, like, let's let's just say what the deal here is. You being somebody who is, yes, you're a Christian, but under their ancient system, if you were to have gone into the Ottoman Empire or somewhere in ancient Iraq, uh, you know, during the uh, reign of the Muslims, uh, you would have been, you know, if you were to live there, you would have had to pay a jizya. But you wouldn't have been persecuted to the extent that somebody like Stardust would be. There is a difference there as far as Women how they would treat you. Women are just second class citizens. Well, yeah, but yes, that's Islam. Like, you have to follow the religion that the majority of the country is in, like the same culture. Like if I went matter. to Women are still Afghanistan secondary again, men. Well, yeah, well, let's, well, well, let's break it down, though. So if Stardust were to go to Afghanistan, what would be certain things that she would not be able to do according to the fiqh? According to the law there, the that fech, that's what they call it. Yes, uh, that uh, oh, fuck you. Uh, that Lord Miles would have been able to do. So if we could just break down legalistically speaking, like where would Stardust uh, start to uh, run into certain issues? Would I be able to travel anywhere by myself? Would I be able to talk to anybody, any of the men there? Would I be able yeah, to? Yeah, she steps off the yeah, plane. Yeah, yeah, have to instantly yeah, wrap yeah. up like a mummy. Yeah, you actually could. You actually could. Should I tell you why? I'd have to. Cover tell you why you could? Wait, wait, one other time. One other time. Who's an outsider? No, no, you wouldn't. Because what they so there's different laws for people who are residents, of people who are immigrants, and people who actually visit there as a tourist. As a tourist, I could basically go there and break the fast beforehand. I decided not to because I actually respect countries I go into and not try and, uh, you know, always change them. Sometimes though, uh, but when I went there, I was given the option to break some rules because I was a guest there. So break you the could go in there with a basic headscarf and be absolutely fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you can honestly just, you can bring a headscarf. You can walk around privately. Someone might go, hey, why, where's your husband? We go, oh no, look, here's my passport. I'm a tourist, and I'm going, oh, fair enough. Hey, Honestly, so, I don't think you'd have many issues going there, and I think that's a lot. Sorry, okay, so again, as a, as a, as a woman who, uh, a brown woman who probably would blend in significantly there, right, um, it's not going to be that way for me. They're not going to assume that I am a foreign person there. If I am there, they are going to um, automatically assume what where what is she doing why does she not have the full covering um and do they are they going to even wait long enough for me to present that my passport to them who knows but we know that they're not going to immediately identify yeah. me as a foreigner uh, here's where i would disagree oh, i think they would because you know yeah. why okay go on i think we so, may think the same number thing. one you can tell through the you could tell through different facial types and stuff like that they would know you're an outsider yes because you don't look like the average Afghanistan woman, even without a face veil, yeah. they would identify you as someone who's from um, a different region. Um, like with me as well, some of them actually thought I was a local because I was white, so I was from Tajikistan, they thought I was from the northern provinces, and some of them actually thought I was uh, an outsider, but it's it was mixed basically, but most of them thought I was fine with the Taliban. And I did see some women around there walking around with headscarves off and having no issues and traveling freely with no issues. It's one of those strict laws that are sometimes enforced when it's needed in the country from their own perspective. But if you go there and if you just start speaking English and just show that your passport, you'll be absolutely fine. Like the issues the I had, fact. I can easily resolve by showing my passport. 
the very fact that you could go there and you said that you were taken as a local by some of mm. them actually shows to me that maybe you had a little bit more going for you than you realize. Mm. So as a dude, right, a, a man in a country where men can do much more than women, you probably are, are able to do much more, right? As a woman, I think um, even if I were a foreigner, even if you say that people might look at me differently, they clearly didn't look at you differently. Some of them thought you were a, a local, mm. right? So we don't know that for yeah, sure, especially were... knowing it's a very, excuse me, I'm not finished talking, okay? Well, especially knowing that it's a very mixed country. We know that it's a very tribalistic country. We know that there are a bunch of different ethnic groups in there. You're cringe. Yeah. Yes, you are. Thank you for holding up the sign for everybody to realize what you are. Um, anyways, uh, so, um, so right. Uh, most people will not be able to tell that I'm uh, whether I'm a local or not, right? If they thought he was a local, then that's clearly mm. like that's completely different, right? It doesn't matter if I'm a local or not. I'm mm. still a woman. I'm still secondary to a man in status in that kind of social uh, uh, social group or society, right? And um, and who knows if they will wait long enough for me to even say a word or even to show my passport mm. for for me to be OK. Even despite that, there's still going to be significant barriers if they find out I'm a foreigner. There's still going to be significant barriers to me doing basic things as compared to a man who's traveling there. If I could answer a bit. No, for, not uh, true. For, uh, you haven't been there. I have. I know I'm talking mm. about. Wait, wait, hold on, Miles. If I could actually, You're not uh, a woman. I, yeah. I, I want, I want to quickly uh, address what Lord Miles Maybe said about him, uh, about him recognizing uh, Miles as being one of the people from a different area. If we're talking about the geography of, let's say, India, and then you have uh, Pakistan, and then you have Afghanistan, that is an interesting question of whether they would assume women who were, let's say, from Pakistan, which would be the closest place, since Stardust, like you, originally from uh, Pakistan in terms of ancestry, correct? India. Yes, India. Yeah, originally. And um, I think it's an interesting question of whether they would assume that somebody who would, let's say, be coming in from India would ever be able to just like naturally be part of the populace here as an uh, Indian woman within Afghanistan. Something tells me not quite. And the reason why I say that is with Lord Miles, since geographically there may be certain tribal places where people do look like Lord Miles does, as far as, you know, being like white, European, stock, whatever you want to say. Like even the guy who runs Afghanistan, uh, Iran Afghanistan, the president, I think he's not there anymore, former uh, football player or soccer uh, for, the, for the Americans. Yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. And he looks so much like a weathered, uh, you remember that um, uh, the mega church guy, Stardust? You know who I'm talking? Mass Bastard. You know who I'm talking about? The guy, uh, Joel Olstein. Joel Olstein. Yes, he looks like a look him up. He looks like a weathered Joel Olstein. That guy. And I could see how somebody like Miles would be able to kind of blend in with some of those certain local tribes. But as far as an Indian woman being there, that's I think there may be some confusion. There, you know what I mean. That's what I would at least give Miles here. That it would not make oh, as much sense. Yeah. Geographically, there would still be confused about me being there, like there was. But they have no issues. You've just listened to the Western media. You haven't researched the country. You haven't actually been there, like I have. And I'm the one that can actually speak on the topic. You know, you're saying that like the, the she sentiment just, she amongst goes, oh, women. Bro, I go you there. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, one words. at a time. One at a time. Miles then Stardust. Yeah. Miles then Stardust. Yeah. Okay, go for it. You've got this weird, uh, magical, made-up fantasy where you'll go there and just instantly be oppressed and you're the strong person who believes in Western values and you'll stand up to them but actually not go there and so on. You'll go there, you'll have some funny looks and then some people will try and speak to you. Maybe the Taliban will just talk to you and go, you know, what are you doing? You just tell you a tourist. They'll actually invite you for food. I honestly think they would treat you very nicely. That's the issue I had. I eventually went there during for a rescue mission to extract someone. But then I ended up having tea with the Taliban several times and getting gifts off them and so on, even when they didn't know I was a foreigner. It's bizarre, but it's a very nice country. And I honestly think you're judging it very poorly. And your understanding of it is very poor, which very much shows. You yourself said earlier that people, the sentiment amongst women in that country about the changes that were taking place there were mixed, right? You yourself said that. 
you had to ask for permission from their husbands to speak to them. I think that's already two huge things that you wouldn't have to do in the West, right? The, um, secondly, there are tons of statistics you can look at the amount of violence that the average woman in Afghanistan has to deal with right in her lifetime like 90 percent of women in afghanistan have, have dealt with some sort of violence in their home um uh so no i don't think that um I, I don't think that what you're saying is accurate you are seeing like the diminishing of their rights as we speak right as time goes on now recently people are required to cover from head to toe right and maybe there's a slow um uh a uh, slow move to that but now they've got segregated buses they've got um uh, uh, they're losing employment, right? You can say whatever you want as a foreigner, but your experience is again as a foreign, um, a foreign male being there, who uh, by some people thought you were a local, right? Who knows if they would even view me, even if I went there. Well, they, wait, I wait. recognize. Wait a minute, let me finish. Even if they recognize me as a foreigner, would they even recognize me as a foreigner from a Western nation, or would they recognize me as a foreigner from India? Who knows what they would recognize me as? Yeah, How because they would hear yeah. your accent and instantly go, yo, yeah, you're Westerner. They would instantly know you're Western. Like if I started speaking English, which I did there, they instantly recognize me. And we're not speaking mm. about the people that live there. I think we agree that obviously head coverings aren't great. Uh, we're both not Muslims, but I we're talking about you going there as a person and you're having to speak for the fact that I said, if you go there, you'll have no issues or very few wait, issues. Wait, wait, let Miles, Miles speak. No, they wouldn't. You're a guest of their country. You're a guest in their country. They would allow you to come there, like I've done, and break rules. You're a guest, and they've got to show you around, and they've got to be kind to you. You can Google all these worthless statistics that are backed by mega corporations that want to, uh, you know, point to a certain point, and you know they have conflicting ideals and so on. But if you actually go there, like I have, and actually experience it for several weeks on two separate occasions, you'll come to the exact opposite conclusion. And you can't talk about the situation because all you do is look at news headlines and statistics. Mm. And goes, oh look, this uh, this article talks about X Y Z rule. Mm. It doesn't the matter. You haven't been there. You're not willing no. to go there. I'm looking You're at just ignorance. I'm, I'm looking you don't at know the situation what there. Been, I'm looking at what. A You're looking at the, wait, 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 wait. Let, let's start us go. Let's start us go. Are you look what a foreign woman said about uh, about traveling to Afghanistan. So you still have to um, you still have to cover up. Um, a woman still stopped her and asked her questions. Um, especially if you didn't have, um, uh, it, like, yeah, if, if you, she still had to travel with a, a man or with a male guide, right? Um, uh, so people would, if they weren't stopping the, the man and asking questions, they would be stopping her. Um, uh, being married makes things easier if you're traveling in Afghanistan, right? Uh, so these are very, very, like, important things and this is somebody this is somebody who traveled to afghanistan as a woman did she say when, anything about their arcade scene whether or not they had street fighter or tekken uh, that's a good question well my miles played that. some video games in afghanistan right you played doom yeah it was lovely yes um doom in real life too <laughs> um it was honestly a lovely country it's beautiful in many ways Honestly, if you go there, you'll have very few issues. I don't care what some journalist writes about, but I've seen people walking around with no headscarves after the rule was enforced and all these other rules that were supposedly enforced. If you just explain your Westerner, like I was questioned many times, there's hundreds of checkpoints because of ISIS being a massive issue in certain regions, If you just, which everyone's a threat under. If you just walk around there and just explain, hey, I'm a foreigner, I'm a guest in your country, they'll go, oh, that's fine. Uh, I know you're meant to be fasting right now, but would you woman. like to walk at your mm. Well, Not here, here, here's what we should do. Hold on, hold on. Here's what we should do. Everybody, everybody, please, 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 everybody. Hold on. Here's what we should do. Stardust, uh, please send me the article. I would want to have a future stream where we bring this woman on with Lord Miles and with yourself and have her explain what exactly went on there. That I think sure. would be interesting. Because sure otherwise, because otherwise we don't know. Like we have to, we have to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But sure I, thing. but I wanted to bring this into to tie all of this together. I think that at a certain point we did start to play certain characters and I really want us to just be like steel man as much as possible what the other person says, which I think we were doing in the beginning when it came to talking about immigration. So 
when we were talking about like Britain and California, let's remember what we talked about earlier on about the British Empire, the Raj and uh, India, how we did point out that there were certain things that were going in a bad direction in India that the British Empire did and the perversing, like, for example, the uh, burning of the widows, uh, the um, pollution of the uh, Ganges River, things of that nature, which is why I think that it is important to point out that uh, there are things that can be approved improved in cultures i don't think that's a bad thing to say i guess the question is do we know if a good of a job uh, that good of a job is being done in places like england today and california in order to do that because at the end of the day we all want people to thrive we all want people to be happy we don't want the ship to fall apart so if we see the british empire doing these positive things for india can we possibly see there being a negative effect of these things not being done when you have people who would come from areas uh you know who are in the third world coming into places like india and then saying well we're not really gonna we're not really gonna criticize their culture we're not gonna do anything and uh it's just naturally going to be a nice beautiful multicultural environment because that at least according to what i got from this whole conversation goes in contrast with something that I think all four of us, I don't know about Mass Bastard, but all three of us at least agreed on when it came to good things that the British Empire ended up doing for India. So I know I said a mouthful here, but maybe we can come together here as far as there do need to be certain improvements in, in the cultures no, that come in. let the world slide yeah, back into I pure degeneracy. Not. Let it destroy itself. It's the nature... It's the course of nature. All things break, all things destroy, all things decay. Eventually, wait, wait, the wait, sun's we going to expand California. and the world will be consumed in a hellish yeah. fire. It's several million years away and nobody cares. Nobody wants to talk about the real issue. What's uh, the real issue? The sun expanding. Sounds like atheism. The sun expanding. That's right. The sun's going to expand and kill us all in a hellish no, fire. No, the real, all the... of humanity, all of Earth. It's all gone. It's all becomes universe. one when the sun uh, comes to Earth. Yes. Yes. Like I from look that forward Tim, to that day. From that Tim and Eric sketch. Yeah. But it all here. This is Stardust. Uh, I know. Since you were, at least from what I got, uh, kind of on the same page with uh, Miles and myself when we were talking about these kind of improvements, you could kind of see Miles's uh, arguments about California, about uh, England where he doesn't see these things being as applied. And I brought in certain things to kind of show that being the case. And again, I'm not saying that there aren't exceptions to that rule, but overall, I think we could emphasize this kind of more culturally related education more and as well as base immigration more on these uh, cultural standards. I don't think that that's a bad thing. I know. Uh, I, uh, look, I don't think I've ever gone against the fact that we should have standards, like modern day standards for certain things, despite whatever culture somebody is coming from, right? And I've never been against um, assimilation, right? I, I, but I think that immigrants in America, uh, like America's done an excellent job of assimilating people within our, you know, within our, our country. We don't have um, the very fact that people are spread um, amongst each other and like, and uh, kind of forced to socialize with each other forces a lot of this assimilation. Um, the fact that, you know, there is this process of even becoming a citizen, learning all this history about America that even the average citizen who's born here doesn't even know, right, um, is also a huge um, thing that that helps people kind of assimilate into this country. I, I don't know how many people I've talked to in the United States who were born and raised in the United States and still don't know how the government works or how the government is sure. structured. It's ridiculous to me. Um, so I don't think that this is... Um, I don't think being an immigrant is is a barrier to being an American. I think mm. if you are an immigrant and you and you choose to assimilate to America, and I think a lot of people do because America they come to America because they want to um, prosper. This is the place where if you work hard enough, you can prosper. Um, and I think a lot of people you'll find are willing to to do what they can to assimilate into American culture, and they're proud of being American as soon as they become American. Um, uh, they're proud of being American before they get to be American, you know? Mm. So I think that, um, I think that the, the, the immigration can really be a strength for us and it has been shown to be a strength for us. But, um, but if you're asking me whether I think that there, like there are some cultural practices that are, are less, uh, um, uh, good than others, obviously, very obviously.
right? I, I don't even know if this qualifies as a cultural practice. I would say yeah. whatever it is in your community that would make sure that, uh, for example, your kids are not going to hang around with some drug dealing uh, kids in the neighborhood. Like you make sure that your kids stay away from those kids. That is like a very basic parental ver- thing, you know, like make well, sure yeah. that the kids. Having the resources to do that, though, like is also a huge part of it, right? Yeah, well, well that also yeah. goes together with the idea of uh, having a cohesive family structure, making sure that there's, you know, mom, mm-hmm. dad, we grandma, can. grandpa. And the very a much nice about, the, about the family sure. structure. No, but, but here, but, so but here is, but, but again, it's like, I want to make sure that we're not being politicians here, because this reminds me of a conversation that Adam Carolla had with, who's that guy who's now um, uh, the mayor or no, governor Gavin of California? Newsom. Gavin Newsom, yeah. Yes, uh, Mass Bastard. You probably the saw guy, that that Gavin Adam Carolla Wilson show is episode. A guy who's well known for banging his campaign manager's mm, wife. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's but that's what people need to think. Yes, about but on the Newsom, exactly no man. But on the Adam Carolla show, but on the Adam Carolla show, he said similar things. Where he said, "Well, immig- immigrants are some of the smartest, some of the greatest." Like, we're we're all adults here. I think we got to break everything down and saying that. Every th- there's a lot of subtlety in these conversations where we can't just there's say outright immig- yeah immigrants are like the greatest no let's let's just l- let's look at let's look at individual cases so for example like breaking in- it down breaking it down still immigrants coming into America value the family structure it's immigrants who come into America who still have the family structure and who still value family values right these are people who very much care about the traditional family and care about caring for their families. So I, I don't see No, that, that is an important factor. Some of yeah, the hardest conservative magazines. Well, well, here, I can, you, I, can you, I can give you I can give you I can give you an example here. And I think this is a very clear cut example. Number one, let's say you're looking at Texas and you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs in Texas who originally came here from uh, Mexico who are now like sec- uh, third generation, fourth generation, you know, people who uh, end up voting Republican and the voting for the wall, you know, they don't want people to cross illegally they consider themselves which they are to be like full-fledged americans yet they came from mexico originally so these are people who i think have embraced the american dream so to speak and then let's compare those to people let's say some immigrants maybe from el salvador who came into california whose uh, kids end up in ms-13 and yeah those kids they have a family they have grandmas, grandpas, yet there is something going on in that structure for whichever reason where these kids end up going into and joining the gangs. So yeah. whatever is the root cause of that issue has to be addressed. And yeah. it's, yeah, that's kind of what I'm breaking down here. I can here. agree with you on that. I can agree with you on that. And I think a lot of that has to do with like having enough resources um, within that community. Um, uh, you know, what, what are, what's the economic situation of that family when they come sure. over as well, right? Because a lot of the time these children, yeah. children who are preyed upon by gangs are people who, you know, these are children who, who don't have like a strong parental uh, person at, at home, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like single mothers. Get them. Yeah, yeah. Th- things I, like I, that. I feel like, no, I feel like people worship a GDP too much. It's more to religion, values, and people. Yeah. You can be in a very poor nation and still not uh, commit murder and rape. Um, you know, it's yeah. social economic values don't play so then too what much do you, into Wait, wait, I, I don't think Star, by the way, sorry, I don't think Star does disagrees with you there, Miles. I think you guys are on the same page. Star does did mention single motherhood know, being yeah. a big factor for a lot of trouble. So I think you guys agree there. Yeah, I mean, empirically, you can look yeah, at, at, at family religion. structure and in two, and two parent households generally empirically across the board, like produce better outcomes for the children raised in those households. But what can we do yeah. for the households that don't have two mm. parents in them? I, I, I want to give you guys a, a question. What do you think is the poorest uh, neighborhood, a poorest village in the United States? Um, something, uh, where, where is... Um... Detroit um, in America, let's see. I don't know. I don't know what the poorest village is in the United States. I just hope it's not mine, the one I'm in right now. Currently. Please don't say mine, Lou. Okay, so the poorest uh, the poorest place in the United States is not a dusty Texas border town, a hollow in Appalachia, a remote Indian reservation, or a blighted urban neighborhood. It has no slums or homeless people. No one who lives there is shabbily dressed or has to go hungry. Crime is virtually non-existent. So this place that I'm talking about is named Kiryas Joel uh, in New York, and it is a Hasidic Jewish town. Oh, no. What's going on there? This also, is why I a think... hollow, not a holler. It's an Appalachian holler. Holler. There, there we go. So the reason why I'm saying this is there is a specific culture there 
which makes sure that kids okay, so in the first place don't go down that route. It's a uh, so it's a town with um, the same demographic. Wait, you're breaking up. Can you say that again? Yeah, he's starting to. That's good. I think out. he's advocating for ethno nationalism. <laughs> Hold on, let's see what uh, Miles says. I think he's about to say that RoboCop 3 was a good movie. <laughs> Hold on, you're, you're breaking up. I like you, mass bas bastard. Yeah, he's I like gone. you too, Dusty. Okay, so it's a homogeneous society with a strong religious background. Excellent. Culturally, That's I can get cu culturally homogeneous. Same thing as in Israel. In Israel, you can be, and I yeah, mentioned totally. this in the previous stream, you could be uh, a Jewish uh, person who's uh, yeah. Arabian, um, a Jewish person who's Ashkenazi. It would I actually, wait, there's RoboCop 3. What? I think he's still delayed. Do you hear me now? Yes. Now he's doing the Verizon guy bit. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? No, it's being. It, I'll it, reference more it's being suppressed. 30 years I'll ago. I'll start advancing. Uh, oh. Miss Cleo, that's a good one. Oh, yes. Only now, if you have food, you need <laughs> You're letting a lot of Ethiopian Jews. Yes, there are Ethiopian Jews who are uh, settling into Israel as well. But the idea is that if you are Jewish and if you uh, like, want um, to be a part yeah, of that anyway. culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know, not always. If, um, Israel doesn't let in lots of Ethiopian Jews and African Jews very often. And also they use racial profiling um, at the airports pretty much. So they're ultra-nationalistic um, in some ways and um, a religious ethno-state. I don't know if it's racial profiling as much as cultural profiling. Because again, as far as the, uh, not even the Arabian Jews, but if we're talking about the, uh, not the Ashkenazi Jews, the um, uh, Sephardic Jews. A lot of Sephardic Jews, if you look at them, they look very Middle Eastern because they uh, have uh, interbred back, you know, after 1492 with a lot of uh, people who were living in Iraq, a lot of these areas, uh, you know, after they got banned from Spain. So I don't think that what the uh, people in the airport there in Israel are looking at are racial things as much as cultural things, which I think can be detected. Again, like Miles, you were in Afghanistan, you would be able to notice when people are of a different culture, how they talk, how they walk, how they interact with the environment. And if you're somebody who is trained in that... Oh, no, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, there we go. So you would reckon... All that I'm saying is that I don't no, think I agree it's... with it, because it keeps the country safe. But... If, you, if you're in that country, you're given a number for one to five. I can't remember which way around is, but let's say one is you're pretty much an Israeli old lady citizen returning home for a nice holiday in Benidorm. And then five is you're, uh, um, you're, you're um, basically from a Muslim nation. You're a single male traveling alone, early 20s. They, they unapolog uh, unapologetically use racial profiling at Ben Guri airports. And people talk out against it, but it's actually the safest airport in the entire world. In one of the most hostile no, but, nations. But what you said right now is not racial um, profiling. No, I'm actually pulling against it. No, but what you're said right it now is, is not racial. It is because you're basing someone based on a race. No, you're not yeah, basing, basing it on the race. race. You're, no, um, you're basing it on the culture. You're basing it on religion. That's very different things. You know, immigrants in the United no, States are less likely to commit crimes than the Americans, country of native-born country. Americans. But it, no, but it's not just the country of immigration. If you are somebody who is a uh, who is a Jew who is traveling from a Middle Eastern country, if you you know like many immigrations were done back when Israel was first starting, that's different than when you are a Muslim who is traveling from a Muslim country to Israel. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page about this. That is not. Oh, it a... brings into account. What? No, it brings into account everything. No, it brings into account every single demographic. Basically, it does use racial profiling at Ben Gurion Airport. Like it, it's a fact. If you Google racial profiling Ben Gurion Airport, it will come up. There's several videos on it. It's been in the news, but they unapologetically judge people that way, and it works. And I, I don't blame them because you know Israel has obviously been under attack. I can see where it's coming from. Well, I'm going to take a look at this, uh, what you're saying here about the racial profiling. The only thing that I would say is that within Israel itself, if we're talking about the rights that are extended to people who are not just Arabs who are Muslims, uh, but if we are talking about in general, like uh, Jews who are of Arabian origin or of, uh, you know, Druze or whatever, 
there is no discrimination, at least when it comes to the system there, from what I found. If you could find me con con uh, contradictory things to that, I would love to take a look at it. But that is uh, what I know right now about that. Oh, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing, but I can find some stuff. But yeah. um, it does also, use also, profiling. Also, one last thing. Do you know what the second uh, language is in Israel, like officially in the uh, parliament? Chinese. Close. It's uh, Arabic. Oh, Arabic. Arabic, exactly. Well, it's surrounded by Arab countries. Exactly. No, but again, the reason why I'm saying the reason why I'm saying this is that Israel is not a uh, ethno state. It is kind of like a religio state, which is also weird because you could theoretically skirt that law like you could pretend to be jewish you just have to do it like really well in the beginning like do the whole song and dance with your local rabbi and then you could get in there but what i think israel is preserving which i think is the most important thing is the culture itself because i consider places like israel to be high level civilizations that are around a lot of civilizations that are not yet at that same level and to me, that's what I care about the most. That's what I care about extending outwards into the world. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Because number one, that does not discriminate based on any race, any um, DNA things. It is purely what are you offering to the world? What are your values? How do you treat other people around you? How do you treat uh, your children, your family? That's all. So it's like a Martin Luther King approach, right? Judge people according to their ca character, not the color of their skin. Right, Stardust? Yes. Mm -hmm. There we go. So no, I, I agree with that, but I don't think immigration should be beneficial to most groups. I think if you want to help people, you send money to their country and create social ties and economic ties. Um, you know, encouraging brain drain in a country is not good for anyone. And Mexico could be a very rich country right now if they basically didn't have a mass exodus of their rich people and of their you know, best, really, that have come to the U.S. So what and I think that would solve happens, issues for both places. So what actually happens is, well, is it's not really brain drain, right? Like what happens is you get these really qualified people who come to America and they um, and they get jobs and they make money. And because they still have families in those other countries, they'll send some money back, right? And then what that hap so what happens as a result of that, let me finish, as a result of that, what happens is they end up, not only are they in improving the lives for themselves, they're improving and contributing to the economy within the United States, they're also improving and contributing to the lives of the people who are still back in their home country. Yeah, my so man, it's actually pretty cool. No, that doesn't work like that. that. So I'll address the first thing. You said that's not brain drain, but the definition of brain drain is the uh, immigration of highly trained or qualified people from a particular mm -hmm. country. So by definition, that is brain drain. Um, you're just wrong with that. And the second thing is you're basically sending a small amount of money that's not guaranteed or regular based on no economic backing towards the other country, which it can't be relied on. It's just one of those things. Um, you're it's like, it's like Go on, let Miles right. finish. Um, it's like when World War II happened, they had to rebuild Europe. They didn't say everyone from Europe come to America. They didn't. No, they sent money over there and created economic, social, and uh, governmental ties and re re rebuilt all the buildings and helped with putting everything back together. And then Europe became a little bit better. And now it's great again to some degree. Um, same with Poland as well. And that's why Poland is doing so well at the moment. It's not inviting everyone in um, at random. It's being very protective of its nation and taking small steps to basically secure its group identity and national culture. Any final thoughts there, Stardust? I think we're going to be concluding soon. Yeah, I have to get going soon, but, um, but uh, I appreciated this talk. Um, despite it being very um, contentious, this is just my style. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. Apology yeah. not accepted. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, but um, I, weren't, didn't you just say a while back that Poland wasn't doing well? No, I said Poland was doing well. I'm pretty sure you said Poland wasn't doing well. No, I, th I think I, uh, I think Miles, you were talking about certain instances with uh, Ukrainian refugees. But again, like I don't know what the numbers are of any problems going on there. I don't think they're as. Oh yeah, uh, I'm saying Ukraine's not doing well. 
Yeah, I'm saying Poland's not doing well with immigration, but Poland overall is very doing is doing very well. That's why I'm going back in a week for a date. It's going to be great. Um, Poland's doing very well because it's very anti-immigration. Mm. Um, the people that are far away that don't align with its values and culture, and it's doing very well economically. When I walk around Poland, I feel safe. There's no litter. Um, there's a strong social tie between people. It's it's a great nation. Mm. What are their arcades like? Mask has one thing um, on his mind. I think yeah, they actually have some retro. Yeah, they have some. They actually do have retro arcades um, really? in certain areas. I, I believe the, the culture, Soviets. Not um, by they, yeah, they the actually color uh, did skin, have... but the content of its arcades. Mm. By the way, Stardust, who is this nine zero zero one character yeah. who's writing mask mask in? What, what is this? Do you understand? Oh, mashing. Oh, that's our meme. That's our meme from my in chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, he's a he's a he's a one of my mods. Um, mm. But yeah, I think just, I think the whole Stardust crew came over. So yeah, yeah. so so listen, yeah. Stardust. I always oh, have, I I had a lot of fun with you here, and I would love for you to come back. I love these contentious uh, back and forth streams. I think they're a lot of fun, and I think you're really good at it. Very. Feisty. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I I apologize again uh, for making it spicy. I, it's just no, don't style. apologize yeah. for the spice. Let yeah. the spice flow, right? Spice right, guys? Flow. Yeah. He who controls true. the spice controls the so universe. <laughs> no <laughs> hard feelings, universe. Miles. No hard feelings, Miles. It's okay. The well, it's okay. I understand that you like lost. The but it's be fine. When you eventually <laughs> no, become move to a California. state of the United States, move to California. you'll be like the second. I think it's going to be just fine. I think it's a pretty good Robocop movie. Some argue it's even better. What a gentleman. I think if you grow the balls, come to Afghanistan and stop talking and whining about certain things without taking any action it'll mm. be great but you know until okay. then until yeah, you, you can um, just decide benefit actually, from being a dude yeah. right at, like in any part oh, of the boy. world here right? we go again listen all the people here I know for... if you want to prove you have bigger balls to me why don't you come over I all right hold on. Like i gotta i gotta speak now i gotta speak now let the spice flow but i gotta speak now all right here we go here we go here we go all right all the people who are following lord miles subscribe right now to break the rules all the people who are following stardust subscribe right now to break the rules Break the rules TV if you are watching this on Twitch and listen up and listen good. Tomorrow there's going to be another stream. I was mentioning this to Lord Miles. The uh, NFTs, the Miladies. I don't know, Stardust. Have you heard of Miladies? Have you seen the Miladies? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Miladies. Invested in Shawnees. Those are the only NFTs I've invested heavily in. I got the tip off that those were going to be the next big thing. Yes, yes, indeed. So I'm posting <laughs> a link over here to the Miladies stream. Miladies are these NFTs that are quasi anime inspired like these anime girls with the big eyes and uh it's uh, like in this nostalgic uh, late 90s anime y2k style but there was a controversy brewing from certain people who may have been responsible for the initial milady creation uh having some groomer situation going on and stardust have you ever heard of kaliak kali accelerationism Okay, so this was like a whole thing that... You want to uh, destroy of worlds. Yeah, well, Mass Bastard, you know about Kaliak, right? Oh, we know all about what's going on with Kali, the destroyer of worlds. Exactly, but they were have you, lots but of you, arms. Oh. One of them has a flower to represent. Oh, you're talking the about the, the you're world. talking about the the goddess of uh, of uh, mm. of death. Right? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, and no, because Kali is considered to be both that goddess, but also Kali, spelled slightly differently, is considered to be the embodiment of the Kali Yuga. Some people say that they're the same thing, but the Kali Yuga is supposed to be the age of destruction, the age of the most misery, after which we are brought back into the golden age. And right. so That's the cycle. She has the one flower. She's got all the swords and weapons, but then yes, one of them exactly. is a flower, which is supposed to represent so, rebirth. So there were these. Uh, so there were these people who are super edgy online. Uh, some of them I have had on uh, BTR. Uh, uh, I think back in twenty and twenty one for the most part. And these are like super edgy people, you know, fascinated with like all the 4chan, Nazi culture. And they would be quite a treat for Stardust, I think, to talk with if they were still around. But there were also allegations this was going on behind the scenes of grooming that the head of Kali named Maya or Mia or whatever was doing. During my whole stint of Break the Rules, if you notice, if you watch all the streams, I have never personally spoken with the Maya character or Mia, whatever. I have spoken to people who know Maya, or have known of Maya, and after the allegations were brought to light, 
Maya left and the whole Cali thing just uh, f blew apart. But now they're saying that these uh, NFTs, the Milady NFTs, were somehow influenced by or the leadership structure is affiliated with Kaliak. The only thing that I could say is that, first of all, a lot of the people who are heavily invested into these NFTs, number one, the people that I don't, they didn't even know what Kaliak was. I knew more about Kaliak than they did. Number two, the community of Kaliak, from what I was able to gauge back when I was on there, it had people who did their own thing as far as talked about a lot of esoteric things. I was somebody who went in there, brought people onto the stream, and tried to show them that just because I am a J, just because I am part of the tribe, does not mean, Lord Miles, does not mean that I'm going to be in the same stereotypical uh, ways that some of them who are very young and inexperienced thought that people of my genetic origin are. And I think I partly did that through Break well, the Rules. That's how prejudice is stopped as one person at a time. Like exactly. Some people think that people from West Virginia are uneducated. Like they'll say that <laughs> uh, into a microphone. And, and then Mass camera. Bastard comes on the stream and talks about caning and proves yeah. everybody wrong. I'll That's tell right. everybody all about everything. Exacto Mundo. I know the solution to the world's problems. Yeah. So, so anyway... This is why we're doing the stream tomorrow, because I want to address all the controversy surrounding the Miladies and the Kaliak connection and so on and so forth. From what I understand, Mia or Maya have distanced themselves and have no role at all in terms of anything that goes on with these NFTs. That's all I know. When I was there in the Discord, again, the conversations were mostly of this esoteric nature. And later on, the allegations started to spring up about the pro-Anna grooming. And Stardust, you know what Anna is, right? Anorexic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anna, yeah. So there was Good God, what is going on? This story keeps yeah, going. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, Lev. I know. Well, listen, if you guys want to know... The world, man? If you guys want to know more about what is going on here, tune in tomorrow... It starts at around 5 o'clock. It's going to be a lot of fun. I welcome everybody to come in there, explore this with us, uh, go into the super chats, need those super chats, and there we go. Uh, Stardust, are you intrigued? Are you interested? Possibly. Possibly. Sounds uh, sounds like a lot, though. That's a lot of, that's that a lot lot of allegations. There's a lot going on there. Buddy. A lot going on. A long list. Yes. No, I mean, the allegations pretty much just like pro and the grooming unless you also count like the esoteric Hitlerism stuff. But again, Ooh. to me, that is already old hat because I've had those people on. I've spoken with yeah, those Hitler people. Yeah, Hitler lost. I think a lot of them were just super edgy for the sake of being edgy. Some of them may have taken it too far. But again, this is why I wanted to call them out on the things that I disagreed with them on. And some of us uh, saw things uh, similarly afterwards. Some of us did not. So that's... That's the way the cookie crumbles, everybody. You're not going to be able to get everybody to see things uh, through common sense, but that's why Break the Rules is here. Because some people will, some people won't, but I don't care about that. I just care the people that, about the people that will. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. Lord Miles, thank you. Stardust, thank you. Mass Bastard, thank you. Where can we find you, by the way? Stardust, where do people go who do not know who Stardust is and want to learn more? Twitch.tv slash Stardust. Twitter.com slash tweets from star and YouTube.com slash Stardust streams. There we are. And Lord Miles, I'm surprised nobody knows who you are, but if there are these people who have been living under a rock, where could they find you? Where would you want to direct them? And how can people help you out on your next adventure? Yeah, thank you. So um, you can find me on Twitter, hundred, I think it was 115,000 followers. And then, I think Twitch, I've used it once. I think I've got 12,000 on there. And then YouTube as well. You can search me up, Lord Miles as well. And if you want to help my ventures, go fund me or crypto, or you could buy some of my Taliban gear. Um, we could put some of it towards women's rights. I'm sure that'd be great. There we are. And uh, Mass Bastard, where could people find you, buddy? Oh, brother, I'm everywhere. I'm all over Twitter. That's uh, mask underscore bastard. You can find my podcast, The Real Weird Sickos, at Real Weird Sickos. I uh, run D and D games for people. I just ran one for the Void Gazers group. Uh, that stream were to be coming out soon. There's uh, there's all sorts of stuff from me. I'm everywhere, all day, every day. The memes uh, never stop. I love your memes. So, everybody all right, so, loves memes. And everybody, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Lefpo. There's a lot of great content coming up. 
for Break the Rules. We're going to have Emperor Lemon coming in soon. That's going to be a lot of fun. He and Turkey Tom are going to be uh, are going to be talking. I'm very excited for that, as well as a lot of other great guests coming up. So please, once again, don't forget to subscribe. Patreon.com if you want to help support this because what Break the Rules invest does in love. invest in love. What Break the Rules does it brings all the people together who otherwise would never have a chance to talk and I'm glad to be able to have facilitated this meeting of the minds today. Yeah, so, I so never thought I'd be on with Dusty and Lord Miles Prower. Like, this feels good. <laughs> it does. It was a fun Thank time, you. Lev. I had a really, I had a lot of fun. Was... Oh, yeah, all right. It was, it was fun winning for me. <laughs> all right, guys. I'm, winning, well, okay. With Hope that, harder. with that, everybody, uh, thank you so much for watching. Mwah! Good night, everybody. Yeah, okay. We do a little Oh wait, 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 wait. Oh wait, wait. Hold on. Somebody says L read the chats. I do read the chats. Let me just make sure if there are any super chats here. Hold on one second. I'm not sure if the super chats came in today, but if they did, let me just do it right oh, now. Yeah, I'm ready to do a heartfelt, re on, re Lev. real fast. What you got for me? Yeah, yeah. If you want to do, and listen, if there are no super chats right now, that is completely fine. We are starting right now we are growing uh because again a lot of different things have been happening right now with uh, break the rules mm -hmm. but i am so glad about the interactions and the meetings and all that let's see what we have okay we do have a five dollar patreon whose name sounds like a real person's name so i don't want to say it uh but other than that no super chats today but anyway thank you guys so much for watching Mwah! good night